Welcome back, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we will now continue with the uh, questioning uh, with uh, Mr. Barr of Georgia for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I see, Mr. Secretary, that Mr. Souter is here, so I don't think we ought to get into a discussion of whether or not he looks conspiratorial. I might disagree with you on that. Uh, I will also not ask you for the record whether I look conspiratorial. Uh, I do appreciate okay, you. Congressman, having traveled to California and back with you in one day in the last 30, uh, you manifestly are not. Do not. For the Sonny Bono funeral, let the uh, record reflect. Uh, I do appreciate, appreciate your being here, and uh, for the record, I don't think that you look conspiratorial either. Uh, there are obviously very serious matters that we're trying to get to the bottom of here, uh, and this whole matter has a very, a very long history, uh, beginning uh, at least in 1993 in October with the uh, request to the Department of the Interior, uh, then the uh, 1994 uh, decision uh, by the BIA area office in Minneapolis uh, approving the request, and then things get kind of sticky. Uh, as you know, uh, in April of 1995, uh, Mr. Patrick O'Connor, who this committee heard from at length yesterday, became involved. Uh, Mr. Clinton becomes involved to some extent, if, uh, if no, no, nothing else, being, being, uh, uh, being asked by O'Connor. And then that sets in, in motion a whole series of events that stretch over uh, the next couple of years. Uh, we did uh, uh, have already discussed some of the uh, admonitions by people uh, in, in the government, including in the Interior Department uh, and over at the White House, uh, urging folks to be very, very careful of this mess. Uh, we have uh, uh, Exhibit 304, the April 24, 95 uh, memo uh, to Cheryl Mills. Uh, we have uh, uh, the also April 24, 1995 uh, memorandum for Harold Ickes uh, from uh, Miss Event. Uh, both of those, uh, obviously with 2020 hindsight, uh, raised a very legitimate concern that this is really a hot potato and every effort ought to be made to keep politics out of it. Unfortunately, uh, some folks may not have uh, heeded that advice, and that's what really brings us here today. You did discuss earlier, Mr. Secretary, uh, <coughs> staff, uh, routine staff requests from the White House and uh, uh, so forth. One name that didn't come up, uh, I know that uh, Mr. Waxman uh, mentioned some names uh, also with regard to whether or not uh, certain people had contacted uh, your office or you personally. Uh, Leon Panetta was not a name that was mentioned. Uh, were you or your office ever contacted by Mr. Panetta with regard to this, uh, this entire matter? Uh, no, I have never communicated with Leon Panetta on this matter. Uh, based on your knowledge of, uh, of the White House and this particular administration and the people that are involved in it, which, which obviously is, is more extensive than mine, uh, if the President of the United States uh, had expressed an interest to his Chief of Staff uh, to inquire into a matter that fell within the purview of a particular department, would that particular department, or indeed the Secretary, uh, be notified that the President has expressed an interest in this, what's going on? Would that be the, in the normal course of, of events? Uh, Congressman, that's an awfully broad hypothetical question. And I guess acknowledging that, uh, the answer would probably be um, it's not the sort of thing that would come to my attention as a generic matter. I think there's a tendency to underestimate the sort of Niagara of information and stuff that goes on in the executive branch of government. Well, but I'm not, I'm not talking about Niagara. I'm talking about a laser beam. Uh, we're not talking, I'm not, I'm not talking about routine staff requests. I'm talking about a request, uh, and we have copies of this, uh, uh, if we could, uh, a notation, a handwritten notation from the President of the United States. Uh, that's not a routine staff request, at least I, I would presume that it isn't. Uh, directed to Mr. Panetta, uh, stating, quote, what's the deal on the Wisconsin tribe Indian dispute? Uh, we don't have a date on this, but according to the earlier efforts by the uh, White House to keep this uh, document uh, confidential, uh, the date that they put on it is uh, 
apparently shortly before the election of 1996. Uh, this is a request by the President regarding a matter that we know on the public record he had been made aware of two years earlier, uh, and he asked a very specific question about a very specific uh, matter uh, within the jurisdiction of your office, and you're saying that that would not be the sort of thing that would be brought to your attention. I think that's correct. This so uh, whose, whose attention in the Department of the Interior would a direct specific request from the President be brought to? I, uh, again, this is all obviously hypothetical. My guess is that a memo like this... Well, this, is, this isn't hypothetical. I mean, this, this is uh, an actual... Well, my, my answer is hypothetical because I don't, I, I don't know the facts. I think normally an inquiry of this type would drift way down through the White House to some pretty low staff level uh, where that staffer uh, in a typical matter would uh, call some staffer at the Interior Department. This is not an inquiry that would prompt anyone to call me. The issue is presumably some facts. The facts are out there, down there. No, that, I mean, that would... In, in, in my judgment. That, I mean, that would raise very serious questions in my mind about how this administration operates. Uh, and I mean, uh, not necessarily just in your department, but the White House. Uh, here we have a specific request from the President about a very sensitive matter. We know it's sensitive because uh, the record is replete with memos going back and forth saying this is a hot potato, this is something very important. We have one memo saying keep the President out of this. Uh, and yet the President makes a specific request uh, to a specific person about this specific matter and you're saying, in your view, this would have been handled by some low-level person as a routine... Congressman, there's one way, to, there's one way to, to deal with this, and that's to ask Leon. And I would suggest you might try that. Well, I've never what, seen you're, what you're saying is, is, in your view, one, you've never, you, you have no knowledge of this, correct? Leon Panetta, you know, I worked for, with Leon for, what, three or four years? He never called me about information requests like this. These are busy people. They got things to do. They well, ship them that's, down. That, that's and my point. They go uh, the president is a very busy person, and one wonders why he would send this note were it not something of some importance to him. Uh, would you speculate on why this was so important to the president that it demanded his personal attention shortly before the election of 1996? Congressman, I have no knowledge or information or ideas on that side. When, when was the, the very first time that this matter was brought to your attention? Um, wait, which matter? This whole matter of the Hudson dog track problem, the very first time. Um, Congressman, I, the earliest recollection that I have from <clears throat> looking back across the record, um, I believe would be the trip that I took to Wisconsin uh, in the fall of 1994. Um, Which was Congressman, let, let me just say that my staff has said to me that the memo that you're showing me here um, is uh, is this a 96 memo? The, the, informa the, the White House did not want this made public, but it, ha it is public now, not, I mean, before this point. Uh, they asserted uh, privilege, uh, apparently something that could not be sustained. According to their information, which they furnished us, they have an, a date on it, fall 96. Now, if they're wrong, Mr. maybe uh, it's some other time. This is a year after the decision was made. Right. But the president specifically asked about this, and um, apparently it was never brought to your, to your attention at that time. And that doesn't strike you as odd? No. Okay. Uh, a lot of things do strike a number of people as odd, though, about this, uh, this case, uh, including the Attorney General of the United States of America and including a United States District Court judge, uh, neither of whom uh, anybody could say with a straight face uh, would be part of any right-wing conspiracy or probably any other kind of conspiracy. 
the opinion, and we do have copies of the opinion, which I presume uh, you all are familiar with, uh, goes through in tremendous detail why this federal judge is concerned. And I know our colleagues on the other side trivialize this opinion. Uh, it should not be. One should trivialize it at their own risk. It is a very specific opinion for a very specific purpose in unusual language because of its bluntness and the detail that the judge places in it. The judge in that case originally had ruled in the opposite as she did here. She says, though, on reflection and on much more careful review of the evidence, some very disturbing questions are raised in her mind about impropriety, including in your office. And I would respectfully invite your attention to this opinion, uh, which I think uh, is probably a lot more problematic uh, for you than your appearance here today, because this is a district court judge, not just a member of Congress. Uh, but this judge is very, very specific uh, in terms of why these questions are very serious and need to be looked into, and I think uh, she is right on point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Waxman, you recognize the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield five minutes to Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, ranking member. Um, let's, let's go back to this memo, uh, Secretary Babbitt, uh, the memo that Mr. Barr just referred to. Counsel tells me that there was no privilege asserted by the President with regard to this matter, and Mr. Barr, I'm sure we'll address that when it comes back around to him, because I don't want the public to be misled on that. Uh, number two, uh, it's my understanding that the decision in regard to this matter was made around July 14, 1995. Is that correct? That's correct. And is it a fact that the document that Mr. Barr just spent so much time uh, talking about is dated uh, October 23, 1996. Did, are you familiar? Do you uh, have the document? Congressman, uh, that's my understanding. I just wanted to make sure we were very clear on that. Uh, let's go back to that document uh, that he spent so much time with a few moments ago. Uh, it says, uh, Leon, what's the deal on the Wisconsin Tribe Indian dispute? And it's signed BC. I, I guess we can kind of assume those are the president's initials. Um, but it sounds like he didn't know what the hell was going on. And that's a year after, more than a year after. Um, I think that's a fair reasonable conclusion. This document. Yeah, it seems consistent with everything that you have said already. But let me go back to something else. You were speaking a little bit earlier, and I listened to you very carefully. And there were some things that you said that, you know, I'm, I'm, you know as, as I listen to you, I say to myself, if any other decision had been made, you would have been damned. Because you gave several elements that went into to this decision. Number one, you talked about the distance from the tribe. You talked about one out of nine decisions, I think. Uh, what did you say about one out of nine? You said... Since the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act was enacted, I think in 1988, there have been nine applications processed under that act, and only one casino is up and operating as an off-reservation casino authorized under this act. And that had unique facts to us. Is that right? Pardon me? That had unique, the one that was okayed had unique facts to it. Is that right? Well, the one that was approved is in... Milwaukee, and the important thing about it is that it had the support of the local community. Right. I, I knew it was something. The, you, so so you, had, you had all of these elements. You had distance from the tribe. You had a precedent, pretty much, that only one out of nine had been approved, and it had been approved with the consent of the, uh, the, the local folk. Um, here you had uh, the community against it. Is that right? So I'm down to the element number three now. And it was bipartisan. Not only was it Democrats, but it was uh, Republicans and congressmen and everybody else was against it. Is that right? That's correct. Pretty much. Um, you said, number four, that no members of the Congress were for it, to your knowledge. Is that right? They were. The record is absolutely devoid of any support uh, from any member of Congress. Now, I've been working this committee today to find some support here. And apparently there's none here either. Oh, no, I don't think you're going to find any here, um, which is interesting. Let's go into number five. Number five element that went into this, you said that there were deficiencies in the application. Is that right? That's correct. 
And then you said, you went on to say that Skibine, I think that's how you pronounce his name, uh, his decision was consistent with the final decision. Is that correct? That is correct. So you've got, now this is just off the top of my head from what I've heard. You've got six elements, all of which are consistent with the decision that finally came out. If you had found in the other direction, God knows what would have happened to you. I mean, it's very interesting that you, 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 you've got all of these factors, and I'm very impressed with the one out of nine. And the reason why I'm so impressed with that is because of, of, of apparently there was a pattern that was set. And you all appear to have been pretty consistent with that pattern. Let me go back to something else. Last week, um, we had occasion to uh, listen to a few of your 65,000 employees. When I say a few, there's two or three, maybe four. And as I sat there and I listened to those folks, I was extremely impressed with their integrity and the fact that they made it very, very clear that their decisions were based upon very sound judgment, that they were based upon things that were completely independent of you, the impression that I got, or the president. And I mean, now that you sit here and, and, and you're under oath, can you, I mean, and I, I don't, I'm pretty sure you're probably pretty much familiar with their testimony. Is it your testimony today, um, Mr. Secretary, that those decisions that were made by Mr. Skibine, and I think, and was it Anderson is the last word person? Is he the last person that signs off? That's correct. Had nothing to do with President Clinton? It sounds like it didn't have very much to do with you either. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Now, you talked a little bit earlier about delegation of authority. And you said something about that if, if you didn't delegate, uh, that you'd have a, a long line of people at your door every day. Um, and then a few moments ago, uh, the other, someone on the other side uh, talked about um, the whole question of your delegation, de that is delegating authority. Um, and the question became that if the White House were interested in, in this, why uh, isn't the secretary, the, why doesn't the secretary know that the White House is calling. And I think you kind of chuckled a little bit and said, you know, that, that it doesn't happen that way. Can you happen, tell us the way it does happen? The mere fact that the White House calls someone from the White House, maybe that message never gets to you. Is that, is that what your testimony was a little bit earlier? Well, I would guess that 99% of the communications from the White House never reach me and are never brought to my attention. And the reason is that there is an enormous flow of information in, and information requests in the government. And the people who work in the White House know that the worst place to get an answer is from me at the top, because the people who have the facts are down there. Okay. And the I hate to cut normal you up. channel therefore go down like that, across, and then back up. Thank you. My, my time is up. I yield back the balance. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Mr. Kucinich, five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to uh, continue on the, uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to continue on uh, the uh, track that my colleague, Mr. Cummings, has, has just started. And that is that I, I want to clarify the record about the department's decision-making process. Uh, as several interior department officials have testified in their depositions, when those officials refer to a decision by the secretary, it's shorthand for a decision by the Department of the Interior. Uh, they would say that the secretary decided not to take the land in the trust or the secretary decided to reject an application and so forth. But what they mean is that that decision was being, uh, was being made to whatever official the responsibility or had been made by to whatever official the responsibility had been delegated to. Is that, is that, that that's correct. essentially correct? So let me ask you this, did, and, and just to go over this territory again, to be sure, uh, did you personally make a decision to reject the Hudson application? No, I did not. And in fact, you had delegated decisions on casino applications to the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. Is that correct? That's correct. And in the Hudson case, 
the Assistant Secretary, Ada Dare, had recused herself because of her relationship with the applicant tribes. Is that correct? Uh, she recused herself. I believe the, the grounds for the recusal were, as I recall her testimony, that she had made a campaign contribution to the uh, one of the leaders of one of the applicant tribes and that she was uncomfortable okay. as a member of the Oneida tribe in Wisconsin in dealing uh, with a Wisconsin issue that was so controversial. Okay. Th uh, she was a, I'm sorry, she was a Menominee, of course. So the, so the decision maker, the, the person who actually signed the letter, was the Deputy Assistant Secretary Michael Anderson? That's correct. And the decision to reject the application was made on a recommendation of the career staff of the Indian Gaming Management staff, is that right? Uh, among others, yes. So did you have any role whatsoever? No. Okay, now I want to uh, turn my now, attention uh, to... Let, let me just say... Uh, that is whatsoever in, in the decision... In the, making in the, the actual decision, decision to the reject decision. the Hudson no. application. No, I did not. Okay. Now, I want to uh, go back for a moment to a point that uh, my friend uh, uh, Congressman Barr raised, because I, I think bringing up uh, the, uh, uh, the, the date of the, um, of the memo with the initials BC on it is relevant, and, and I think the Congressman's uh, attention to that matter is, is germane. However, it's also germane to look at the, at the, uh, at the dates that were involved. Now, what was the date of this of this memo, uh, which is marked BC, what's the deal on the Wisconsin tribe Indian dispute? What's the date of that? Um, Congressman, <clears throat> I can't discern a date from the face of the memo. Mr. Barr said that I believe this was from the fall of 1996. Okay, well, let's say it was around October 23rd, 1996. Now, we know the date of the decision was July. 14th, 1995. So this memo, as, uh, as uh, Congressman Cummings points out, was more than a year later. Uh, that changes the context, certainly. But we also know that Mr. Uh, Havanek was up here testifying, um, and Terry McAuliffe, of course, disputes whether there was a conversation between the two of them. But that conversation happened on August the 15th, 1996. So. I'm going to suggest uh, to, to uh, uh, members of the committee that it is quite possible that uh, Mr. Havanick, who is a, a strong advocate for his case, was able to make his feelings known through legal action, so much so that it reached uh, right to the White House, and that, in fact, the President's memo might be because of action that Mr. Havanick started and not because of any action that started on behalf of the other side. So I uh, thank the Secretary, and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Sununu is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. You don't believe that I'm part of a conspiracy against you or the Department of the Interior or the President, do you? I would not even accuse you of being part of a New Hampshire conspiracy, much less this one. Thank you very much. Uh, in your testimony, you have commended the work of the dedicated civil servants, the career staff uh, at Interior working under Mr. Skabeen, uh, and, and I would agree. Uh, there, they, and particularly Mr. Skabeen, is to be credited with the quality of his testimony and certainly the duration. You feel that their recommendation uh, in this case was very important, correct? Uh, they are. That's the whole purpose of the Indian Gaming Office is to uh, receive these applications. Thank you. Uh, and the process. Would it, would it be appropriate for political appointees to overrule their recommendation if it was a unanimous recommendation on a, uh, on a point of policy? The <coughs> decision-making authority the, uh, by, by virtue of my delegation uh, is uh, vested in the Assistant uh, Secretary for Indian Affairs. Now, if the Assistant Secretary for, were the Assistant Secretary to disagree with a recommendation from the gaming office. That would almost certainly be elevated to my attention. Okay. Thank you very much. That's very important. I want to draw your attention to uh, some very substantive uh, exhibits uh, in the substantive issue of justifying the application under Section 20, a Section 20 finding of no detriment to the community. I'd just like to cite several key documents. I'll read briefly from them. I think you're very familiar with them. On June 8th, these are all documents from the career staff. Exhibit 303A-8, 
A memo from Mr. Hartman states, the staff recommends that the secretary, based on the following, determine that the proposed acquisition would not be detrimental to the surrounding community. Second, Mr. Skabeen, head of gaming, his email on June 6th states, quote, quote, we want to avoid making a detrimental uh, a determination under Section 20 of the IGRA. Third. I'm sorry, Mr. Congressman, could you give me the, def uh, the exhibit numbers? E You're going a little fast. The exhibit number a there is 316. 303A is the first. 303A-8 and exhibit 316 is the second. The third, exhibit 320. An email dated June 28th, Mr. Skabeen again. Indian Gaming is also drafting a proposed memorandum to the commissioner concluding that the acquisition is not detrimental to the surrounding community under Section 20. And finally, Mr. Skabeen's testimony to this committee under oath. I wanted to avoid invoking Section 20. All the way up until his final email that I cited on June 28th, Mr. Skabeen and all the staff at Gaming believed firmly there was no justification for turning down this application on the basis of Section 20 that there was a detriment to the community. But between June 28th and the decision memo on July 14th, that, recommended of George, that recommendation of George Skabeen and the career staff was overruled. They, the career staff, were overruled. And in the final rejection, Section 20 was cited. And I'll just quote briefly from that, Exhibit 328-2. The rejection letter, we believe the proposed acquisition would be detrimental within the meaning of Section 20. Who overruled all the dedicated career civil servants at Indian Gaming? I think that's an inaccurate characterization of all of these documents. Uh, um, I, 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 I don't accept that characterization. It, I don't think it's an inaccurate uh, characterization of Mr. Skameen's testimony. I wanted to avoid invoking Section 20, nor his email, we want to avoid invoking Section 20. Well, there was a, the, the decision was based on both Section 20 and the Indian Reorganization Section 20 was Act, definitely and Mr. Skameen has in fact stated that he agrees with that decision. And that the I've, facts state that he objected to invoking Section 20, and I will further quote from Mr. Skabeen. He I, don't states, th I don't think he did object to well, Section 20. He states in his testimony under oath in the documents I just presented to you, I wanted to avoid invoking Section 20 as late as June 28th. In his testimony to us, he further said, there were some in the department that felt the record justified a decision under Section 20. When asked, who would they be? His reply, they would be the ones that were up from the chain of command. Political appointees, who overruled Mr. Skabeen? Uh, I think John Duffy addressed this uh, yesterday. There was, in my understanding, a Pretty spirited discussion. I, I absolutely reject this idea that anybody overruled anything. The record doesn't support that. There's not an iota. Of, well, let me present uh, a piece of evidence, of evidence that, that does support it directly, and it's related to Mr. Duffy. An email dated July 6, 1995, Exhibit 324, written by Troy Woodward. It states clearly, final paragraph, the upshot of the meeting was that Duffy wants the letter rewritten to include a further reason for denying to take the land into trust under Section 20. It was, in fact, on or about July 6th that the decision was made to overrule Mr. Skabeen. It was made by Mr. Duffy, and he suggested that they rewrite the decision. I don't think anybody overruled anybody. I think that the record clearly shows that this decision was based on both Section 20 and the Indian Reorganization Act, and that the participants all concurred in basing it on both statutes. The decision does cite Section 20, but the decision to cite Section 20 was made by political appointees and not by Indian Gaming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, who on your side? Uh, Mr. Mr. Kenjorski is recognized for five minutes. Uh, to carry on that, uh, 
let the, let the record show that Mr. Scabane testified that he prepared the draft of the final decision before leaving for vacation sometime on June 12th or 13th. And if, in fact, uh, there was a decision by Mr. Duffy to include six, Section 20, that was really going out with a hand to allow the petitioner to have the right of appeal and judicial review. If that had not been included, they would have lost that right. So there wasn't any detriment to the dog track owners. It was to their benefit. Yeah, I, I frankly don't understand that. which conspiracy theory the Section 20 well, uh, conspiracy is because, in fact, uh, as you suggest, uh, grounding it on Section 20 was more favorable to the applicant. Now let's go on with conspiracy, Mr. Secretary. I've been going through this record here a little bit. You wouldn't be here today if, Mr. if, if, if your former law school roommate, law partner, and friend hadn't imposed his right to meet with you that fatal few days before this decision. And I'm not going to ask you to characterize your thoughts on Mr. Eckstein, but I think one Mr. Eckstein should be here. I don't know why someone with such important testimony hasn't been called before this committee. Because the thing that upsets me is that in uh, his testimony in 1997, for the first time, Mr. Eckstein gets this uh, October 30th, 1997. He has this tremendous recollection that you indicated these things about political contributions and $500,000. Now, it gets curiouser and curiouser, because then in that deposition, he says he's certain that he told Mr. Goff about that conversation the day that it was done, July 14th, 1995. He thinks he told Mr. Moody, Jim Moody, a former member of Congress who was a lobbyist for his organization, and he thinks he told Mr. Habernick. Now, why that's important is that conversation is probably the most significant statement of words that would justify any inference of political influence. And yet, Mr. Eckstein, a lawyer, the owner of the dog track, and his chief publicist, who all should have had knowledge of this, did not mention in their affidavit in the suit they brought in January of 196 to overset the application or the decision. They never mentioned it until the October 30th, 1997 testimony. Now, why that's curious or incurious to me, it seems as we go on with this case, there's tremendous recall that's occurring that seems to be beneficial to the uh, uh, palance here. Uh, Mr. Havener came before the committee, and by chance he remembers a tremendous conversation between the president's chief uh, fundraiser, Mr. McAuliffe, uh, that he mentioned this to him at a fundraiser at Mr. Berlin's home or one of Mr. Berlin's fundraiser, and for some reason, they have all these high-priced lobbyists, all high-priced lawyers are in the in federal district court in Wisconsin fighting this tremendous case, and none of, none of them seem to have any recollection of the most important evidence that could have helped their case. Until after the decision, the court coming down and saying, we'll take extra administrative record discovery testimony to prove uh, or to set aside this decision, and then all of a sudden, after two years of silence, new recollections occur. Let me say that in the Wisconsin State Journal, Mr. Goff, after having been told this two years before, but then after the testimony in October of 97, he said, we consider this report to be the biggest piece of news in two years. I don't know where, he had this information for two years before that. He didn't think it was very good news until at a Senate deposition in October 30th, 1997, it came out. I, I, I just wonder, I'm not going to ask you to, uh, to uh, uh, hi hypothesize on your friend uh, uh, who asked your indulgence that day, but I've got to say, in my mind, that a well-trained lawyer is either Harvard or Yale, uh, Mr. Secretary, I'm not sure. Harvard or Yale, isn't it? Yes, Har Harvard. Okay, and Mr. Eckstein didn't recognize the significance or the importance of that conversation in your office a day or two before the decision was had in the pursuit of their appeal case in Wisconsin for a period of more than two and a half years. That sounds incredible to me. I think that uh, we talked about conspiracies here, and, and I just want to reiterate uh, 
what is happening as I see it, Mr. Secretary. People are grabbing notes and paper and thrashing around to hang anything. Here we have a conspiracy being constructed on the other side by the President of the United States and his Chief of Staff, Leon Panetta, some year and three months after the decision's already made. Mr. Panetta sends the President a memo uh, on a trip uh, late October into Wisconsin, just before the election, a year or three months after the decision. The President apparently reads the memo and he says, what's the deal on the Wisconsin tribe Indian dispute? Back to, to Leon. Uh, so obviously the White House and the President were heavily involved. It's a year and, a, and three months after the decision was already made. It's out of the hands of the Secretary. It's into the courts by more than a year and a half. And the President still doesn't know anything about it, and yet we're to believe that this was one of the highest items handled in the campaign of 96 and that, and that everybody was involved in it because of this uh, tremendous uh, fundraising opportunity. Uh, I, I think what we have here is, is evidence that when people thrash around to find conspiracy or find conclusions, they, they can knit together the most unreasonable materials to make their, uh, uh, their scarf, if you will. Uh, I see my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shattig. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gee, the word conspiracy certainly come back in here in the last few minutes. Um, I, it is appropriate for each of us, Mr. Secretary, to draw different inferences from this record. Your adamant assertion that, there, that the political appointees in the office did not overrule the career people, I believe, is clearly wrong under this record. And my colleague, Mr. Sununu, read some of these emails. He did not read all of them. I would draw your attention to Exhibit 327-2, uh, an email which I think very well illustrates this point. And it is one of the culminating emails, although the same point is made in a later email. It is written, and it says, apparently Bob Andrews, Anders did review the letter late Monday. I checked with him Tuesday, and he thought that since Duffy wanted the Section 20 finding so badly that we would let the letter go in, we, that we, that's why we let it go in the letter. And then he goes on and says, I still think that there was not enough evidence for a Section 20 finding. In your opening statement, Mr. Secretary, you repeatedly called this a consensus process, a consensus uh, a, a consensus decision that resulted, or a consensus discussion that resulted in this decision. That, I think, Mr. Secretary, does not show a consensus. But let's move to another area that I want to focus on in my questioning. Uh, could, could I just respond to that? Sure. Just briefly? Uh, I fail to understand uh, what it is you're all driving at. There was consensus on the decision. Well, well, there, Mr. Secretary, the decision was based limited. on both sections. I don't see a consensus. I don't see a consensus Five in this memo. Section 20. Two people are saying they disagree. That's not a consensus. They, they agree. And one of them overruled them. They agree. One higher up in the level. They agree on the result. There is no, they, clear that's not the evidence. Issue. The issue isn't whether uh, they if agree I can answer result. the question, if the, I can, if I could respond, question. if I could respond, there is a obviously a lively discussion going on once people have agreed on the result about how it is. You base the decision and the relative role of Section 20 versus the Indian Reorganization Act. Mr. Fine. Mr. Secretary, what does it add up to? My time's limited. I think the record shows that they disagreed, and the emails show that. But I really would like to focus on a different issue. I think you've referred repeatedly to the record in this case. And I want to point out that a part of this record is conduct by Mr. Ickes, which I would hope you would disassociate yourself with. Loretta Event, and I hope you have seen these memos, wrote a memo to Mr. Ickes. It is Exhibit 305-1, in which she makes a clear case that this decision is to be made on the merits, it is to be based on the rule of law, and the White House should in no way get involved, and that it would be political dynamite for the White House to get involved. She writes that memo, and she sends it to Mr. Ickes. Mr. Ickes' response to that memo is not to agree with her, not to respond and say, yes, I concur, uh, not in any way to accede to this prudent advice, but rather to immediately pick up the phone and call the lobbyist that wants to insert politics into this matter. 
and to assign two, at least two, of his deputies to communicate with your department about this. Mr. Ickes then gets a letter, uh, which we discussed at length yesterday, Exhibit 311A, from Mr. O'Connor, the lobbyist, who seeks to inject Republican versus Democrat policies into this debate and say that the decision should go in favor of his clients because they are Democrats and Democrats who gave money. Mr. Ickes does not respond to this letter by saying there is, it would be improper to let politics or past contributions or future contributions to affect this decision. What Mr. Ickes does is to continue to stay involved, to continue to commu communicate with his staff, and indeed to have a yet subsequent conversation with uh, a member of Mr. O'Connor's law firm, Mr. Schneider, in which he says, I will take care of it in response to Mr. Schneider's request that he handle this. My question to you, Mr. Babbitt, is don't you believe that Mr. Ickes should have handled this dramatically different, and would you be in the spot you're in right now if, for example, he had responded to Mrs. Event and said, you're right, we should stay out of this. He had written back to Mr. O'Connor and said, Mr. O'Connor, politics doesn't belong in this. Or if, at a minimum, he had warned his staffers, whom he then directed to communicate with your department, to put a memo in the file, send a memo over to your department saying, we're getting political pressure on this, but we want you to make it on the merits. I think he put you in a terrible position, and I think his conduct was wrong, and I'd like your response to that. Well, you can assemble those facts and characterize uh, his conduct that way. Uh, I don't. Um, and I think that, you know, in fairness, uh, you should direct these questions to Mr. Rickey's. My responsibility is internal to the Interior Department. I am not, you know, on this wider ground that I discussed in my testimony this morning. I'm but your staff communicates with his staff. We've, we've been through that a hundred times. Staff's when talk there to staff. Are, when there are information requests, they've got to go somewhere. And I don't draw the conclusion that you do. I'm not drawing any conclusion. Requests. My conclusion is that he could have built a record which would have protected you in this instance by saying, I don't want to affect the merits. He could have sent a note back to Mrs. Event saying, you're right. He could have sent a note to Mr. O'Connor. And I'd like to believe, Mr. Secretary, you would have done those things. Well, I, I appreciate your comments. I guess I, I'm, I'm at a loss to comment on a world of what ifs. My time's expired. Mr. Cummins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, you know, I find it very interesting, the comments about consultation and whether this is a consensus process. We've heard some of the uh, other side suggest repeatedly that the Interior Department officials failed to consult with representatives of the applicant tribes. The majority makes uh, this assertion despite clear deposition testimony to the contrary given by the career civil uh, servants. For example, when Thomas Hartman was asked whether there had been consultation with the applicant tribes, he testified, and I quote, it was done extensively at the area office. They kind of work hand in glove there, end of quote. Mr. Hartman went on to say that in our, quote, in our office we did, when the application was at the central office, we met with the applicant tribes and representatives several times and discussed various issues, both on the best interest and the not detrimental portions of the two-part test. So we consulted with them even while, even while, it, was in, while it was in central office, end of quote. Um, you know, when we talk about this consultation process, I just wonder in consensus process, it seems as if it's, it would be kind of difficult to cure community opposition. I mean, all of us uh, up here are elected officials. Many of us served on a local level. Opposition by communities is usually pretty, they, they pretty much dig in pretty deep. And they have strong opinions. And I'm just wondering if the consultation process or this consensus process, is that something difficult to overcome from what you know? That is when Mr. the community Cummings, is I, against something. I, I appreciate the question. I think it's very important as you deal with this consultation process to remember that beyond the written record, there was a continuing flow of oral communication back and forth and consultation, and that it's a mistake to jump to a conclusion that there was not adequate consultation just from reading documents. You must have uh, the oral communication and the give and take in. 
Now, this issue of community opposition, it seems to me, stands out from the very beginning. And what happened is the opposition actually hardened as, as the application progressed. And I don't see how anybody could miss that. Now, what, well, what they do about it is, you know, another matter, because there wasn't much flexibility here to go to, you know, some other part of the county and somewhere else. Uh, it was absolutely anchored uh, in this uh, uh, dog track. Now, uh, let me also add that uh, there is a letter in the record uh, from the three applicant tribes dated June 7th. It's in the record. It says, they've had an opportunity to review the comments submitted through May 17th, 1995 on the application. Now, I haven't gone back to review all the comments, but I have a pretty good idea what those comments were. And a lot of them were this issue of community opposition. It's not as if they didn't know about it. They had a chance to review it, and they wrote back and acknowledged it. What's, what's the date of that uh, document? That letter is dated June 7th, 95. 19, 1995. You know, it's interesting, too. Did you have something else? Um, it just says, we urge that you promptly process the application, and we're willing to meet with you to discuss your concerns. It's interesting, too. Uh, Mr. Scabine, who, again, I reiterate, I have much respect for his testimony. Uh, he gave similar testimony that I talked about earlier about consultation with applicant, tri applicant tribes. When asked whether the proponents and opponents of the proposed casino have an opportunity to submit, to submit their views for the record until a final decision was made, Mr. Scabine responded, quote, yes, they did, unquote. Mr. Scabine went on to say, and I quote, we met with them on several occasions where the purpose of their meeting was to try to discuss the merits of their application. And I think that we were given access to additional comments that were filed between February 8th and April 30th, 1995. And I think they submitted something in writing at some point. Um, let me, did you have something else? Uh, yeah, I think what was submitted in writing was the letter I just Right. Right. Let me, let me move on to something else that I find very interesting. Secretary Babbitt, according to the testimony we've heard during these four days of hearings, there were many lobbyists trying to influence the department's decision. The opponent tribes had lobbyists, and Mr. Havenick uh, had lobbyists. In fact, it was Mr. Havenick, the dog track owner, who hired uh, Paul Eckstein, your friend and former colleague, in hopes that he would be able to convince you to approve the application. Isn't that correct? I, I believe that's correct. Um, despite Mr. Havenick's efforts to go to the top, Mr. Eckstein was unable to persuade you to get directly involved in the Hudson application. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Earlier, the majority referred to a memo from Scott Dacey, one of the opponent tribe's lobbyists. To, the majority referred to a small part of the memo that looks incriminating. But also, in that memo, it says that Mr. Dacey spoke with Michael Anderson, who had the final decision, and that Mr. Anderson told him that the department was going to, quote, keep this on the merits, which meant that they were not going to outside influences, that they were going to stay strictly on the merits. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Does that surprise you that that's what Mr. Anderson would have said? Uh, no, because I think that's clearly what the record shows uh, for the entire process. And I take it that you, you, you wanted a certain distance from, from certain kinds of decisions, or I guess you wouldn't have delegated, would you? Well... As a general matter, uh, I am not involved in specific decisions that relate to contests between parties for specific authority, whether it's a permit, a, a, a transfer, uh, a contract, uh, because there are literally thousands of these decisions made, and you, know, you can't efficiently sort of sit around in all these case-by-case -case decisions. And that's the reason that most of them are delegated, including these particular uh, type of decisions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Haskins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. Mr. Secretary, uh, yeah, you know, I, I just want to come at this a little different angle. I've followed your career for a long time. Indeed, I, I look at you as an honorable man. Uh, came out of college, served in the Peace Corps in South America. Is that correct? Well, it was a community organization. And studied uh, economics in Peru, 
and uh, then went on to be uh, the governor of uh, the great state of Arizona. And, you know, you had quite a credible career. I just uh, I'm a little bit <coughs> amazed that you buy into this thing of, of conspiracy. I, I mean, you got to look at the views and what's happened, and I, I would hope that we all agree there's no conspiracy here. We see facts different, and we're trying to build on that. I'd like to ask you a couple questions, first of all. Uh, would you agree, <coughs> at least the data that we have, that on <coughs> September 14, 1994, uh, there was, a, by the Department of Interior document, the finding of no significant impact, and that was prepared by the Ashland office. That was a local office, and they approved, basically, the recommendation, said there's no negative impact. And then on November 15, 1994, the area office recommendation in Minneapolis said that there was no negative impact. And, uh, that application for a class three gaming facility at Hudson satisfies section 20 of IGRA, and that was a basically approved. And then in April 20th, 1995, the area office recommendation in Minneapolis and the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs basically said, again, under 20, uh, section 20, they would approve it. There's, there's no uh, negative impact. And then there's a draft memo from the Indian gaming uh, management staff and the staff recommends that the secretary, based on the following, determine that the proposed acquisition would not be detrimental to the surrounding community. And that was under Section 20. And then uh, there's a draft uh, memo we have undated uh, from George Skabeen to the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs. And the staff recommends that the secretary, based on the following, determine that the proposed acquisition would not be detrimental to the surrounding community. And in fact, even in the surrounding community, you talk about the overwhelming uh, people that were against it. Well, there were basically uh, 71 letters from Wisconsin folks, uh, 19 letters from Minnesota, and 37 letters from people in other states that were against it. But for it, uh, we had a 69 letters from, from Wisconsin and 19 letters from other states. So, and a number of people, including state senators and mayors and county supervisors and other folks that were for this thing in Hudson, Illinois. Or, I'm sorry, I'm betraying myself, Hudson, Wisconsin. And um, so we don't really see an overwhelming give or take. I would see that's what the record shows. My question is, and I think it was unfair to you this morning, as sec uh, as Chairman Waxman, or former Chairman Waxman was here and you know, talked to, started talking about white lies and you say, well, what I said might have been a white lie. Well, I, I wouldn't ever want to portray it in that sense, but quite frankly, you know, we have to try to sit here and determine what are white lies and what are gray lies and what are brown lies and what are black lies. I just want to ask you, this Eskin is an old friend of yours, his law partner, and do you think he's an honest man in your opinion? Yes. And then, with your saying this morning that from Mr. Waxman, that what you said to him could have been a white lie because we all do it, this type of stuff, could Exkin actually be telling the truth when he said that you said, in effect, that the Indians gave a lot of money, around a half a billion dollars, to squash the application? I, 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 I don't think that's Well, that was a characterization correct, uh, of what you said. Uh, what uh, he said description under, of what he said. That's a characterization of what he said. Under, yeah, but I don't think that's accurate. Well, that's not word for word. You want I, me I, to I, read it word for word? Yeah, uh, I think that would sure, be helpful for the record. Sure, I would be happy to do that. Word for word is, according to the uh, record of the Thompson investigation, uh, Patrick O'Connor's letter to the secretary, and I personally was offended by it, uh, I couldn't believe that anyone would make the allegations in that letter seriously, and the secretary said at some point, when we were standing up, asked me rhetorically, do you know how much, comma, I believe it was these tribes, but I cannot be clear in his words uh, to me what those tribes meant, referred to. Whether it was some specific tribes or tribes of gaming facilities on their reservations had contributed to either the Democratic Party or the Democratic candidates to the DNC. I can't be certain of that, but I'm certain that he asked that he asked the general rhetorical question. And I said, I don't have the slightest idea. 
And he said, responding by saying, well, it's on the order of a half a million dollars, something like that. And I don't have any said. recollection that of that testimony. conversation. Do you think he could have been telling the truth? I can tell you that I have no recollection of that conversation. And Fine. That's, that's it. Fine. That's great. I just want to say that, you know, I don't think that there's any scheme, and I don't think that there's any, but we have to look at issues. And the issues are that, you know, the application was approved at the local level on 20, on Section 20. Lobbyists close to the president were hired. Uh, Harold Ickes became involved. The decision to reject under the Indian Gaming Regulator, uh, Regulatory Action is made. We changed the section. They went to a different section. And uh, Mr. Scabine, in his testimony, said that that's the first time in his recollection, recollection and probably in history, that they went to a different section to make that decision. So, Mr. Secretary, I appreciate you being here. And I certainly, in your shoes, it's a tough thing to do. You are an honorable man. But we have to make some conclusions from the facts that we have before us, from the testimony uh, that was given in this committee and other committees, especially in the other body. And, uh, you know, we'd like to come down to the bottom of this thing and find out just what the connections were. And that's all we're trying to do is our job. And I appreciate your testimony. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Kostinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I would also like to voice uh, an agreement with my colleague in saying that uh, we believe that the secretary is an honorable man. And I know also there's such concurrence in this committee that the right decision was made. So we are making progress and agreeing on some things here. Now, uh, part of the problem in hearing and gathering information, you can't have different interpretations of a fact. People look at the world a different way. Uh, we recently heard an interpretation of contacts between Mr. Ickes and the Interior Department staff. I've heard uh, many different interpretations by members on the nature of those contacts. I would just like to point out uh, to the chairman that sitting in the audience behind the secretary is his assistant, uh, Heather Sibison, and she was the person, if I'm correct, who responded to the status request from the White House. So uh, rather than, s we can actually be spared the burden, and it is a burden of characterizing what happened during those contacts. We, we actually have an opportunity now, uh, if, if, the, if the chair would uh, be so pleased, to uh, hear directly uh, from uh, Ms. Sibison. And uh, would the chair, uh, do you have any, uh, willingness at all to hear what she has we, to say. We uh, have deposed uh, Ms. Sivison, and uh, we have the information that we needed for this hearing. We've, uh, the problem we had is we had to schedule the hearings over a four-day period, and we had to make sure that everything fit into that schedule. So, but, but we did, uh, we did uh, depose her, and we have the information that we think. I, I, I would, uh, and, and it's, it's, I'm sure it's helpful to have deposed her, and I could just say as a member of this committee, I think it would be helpful to the committee if uh, we had the advantage of listening to her testimony, but Again, you know, the chair uh, has the authority to do that, and I understand that, and we understand that. Um, now, I've heard many members uh, reassure us they're not on a, on a witch hunt, they just want to find the facts, and I'm at a loss to understand why uh, she hasn't been called, because um, she could tell us the simple truth, which I, I, I believe is that the calls from the White House were status inquiries from low-level staffers and volunteers. Um, you know, it would be nice to hear from her. It would be nice to hear from Mr. Ickes, uh, from um, Hilda Manuel, Congressman Gunderson, uh, Governor Tommy Thompson. I, I, I hear, I, I feel like we're having a party here, but we're not inviting all the, all the guests. Um, now, there's a few other points here that just to put in the record. Uh, we know, again, that the, that the decision uh, came down in 1995, I believe it was in July, and we also have here from the record the uh, briefing papers for the president on uh, September 1st, 1996, where in this uh, it points out that uh, this is uh, the paper right here, Mr. Babbitt, where it points out that the administration has been criticized for a Department of Interior decision that affects Indian gambling in Northwest Wisconsin 
One tribe was denied permission to expand its casino and sued the United States, alleging other things, uh, among other things, that the White House staff improperly influenced the Department of Interior's decision. Uh, and this uh, uh, is, uh, it says, Bob, can't make out the last name, uh, uh, DNC Finance Council represented the aggrieved tribe. Now, um, that's that direct quote. Now, that's part of the, of the record which briefed the president. Then, as a result of getting this briefing, the president then writes, and again, this is um, uh, a year later, uh, what's the deal on the Wisconsin Indian dispute? He writes this to Leon Panetta. On October 21st, 1996, Leon Panetta responds to the president's uh, memo uh, saying, in response to a note in a background memo for your visit to the Green Bay, uh, which, uh, Milwaukee area, you inquired about the status, status of a dispute uh, between the Interior Department and Native American tribe in Wisconsin. And then he goes on to talk about an attached uh, memo. Th these, these are all, I believe, in the record right now. I just wanted to make sure that the sequence was clarified. Now, I'd like to turn my attention, uh, Mr. Secretary, to some other testimony. This committee has heard from the dog track owner who, who needs a casino to, uh, to save his business. And we've also heard from representatives of Indian tribes uh, the, that um, uh, the dog track owner needs in order to uh, bring a request for an off-reservation casino. Now, we know for the record that the Department of Interior, in evaluating the dog, track, the dog track owner's business proposal, had to consider a preponderance of evidence that the community around the uh, dog track opposed the casino. Uh, here's what I'm wondering. You know, as someone who's very concerned about the effects of government policy on local communities, I was wondering what would have been the policy implications if the department had decided to allow tribes to go 80 to 200 miles off the reservation <coughs> to open a casino against local opposition? Well, had, <coughs> had the department in these, on these facts approved this, there would have been a firestorm, not only in the community, but in the United States Congress. Um, and I think John Duffy, I did not hear his uh, testimony yesterday, but I know that this was a concern of his all along, and it may in fact account for some of this ongoing discussion about Section 20 uh, uh, versus the Indian Reorganization Act, because um, we were very concerned to administer this act in a way that was consistent with what we think Congress intended, and Congress could not have intended to, uh, you know, have us administer uh, this act in a way that would simply create a firestorm uh, every time one of these things uh, came down the road. Well, uh, you've established. Gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen's time has expired. Thank well, you, Mr. If you want to go another round, we can. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Gentleman from California, would you would you yield to me just uh, real briefly? Certainly. Gentleman, yielding to me real briefly. Uh, it's my one understanding, uh, Mr. Secretary, that there was a case involving a an Indian casino where land was put in trust some 300 miles from the tribal lands in Greektown. Uh, Town, I think it was in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, is Mr. That, Chairman, is that, that was uh, that's the uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Detroit case, and it had strong local support. But it was 300 miles away. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm curious, uh, Mr. Secretary. I read your uh, statement very carefully uh, last night and uh, again this morning. But uh, when you delivered the statement, it was quite different. Uh, was that gone over by people in the White House uh, to rewrite? Uh, we had rather colorful language there. I think even conspiracies might have come up. Uh, did you consult anybody in the White House? Did they clear it? I have consulted no one in the White House. How about, about in the this. Department of the Interior? <laughs> well, certainly. I, had, I mean, it's uh, a complete That rewrite. statement, I appreciate uh, your eloquent. appreciation of the eloquence of the statement. Right. Uh, those words are not exclusively uh, my handiwork. I listened to the testimony over uh, the two days uh, last week and, uh, for that matter, yesterday, and uh, put this statement to bed over my dining room table about uh, 5.30 last night. 
did you have the help of anybody that's an expert political consultant or an expert lawyer, Mr. Cutler, your own lawyer, so forth? Well, I, uh, I have retained counsel, and they certainly uh, review documents that I submit uh, under oath to this committee, you bet. Well, I, I hear in the news sometimes the, a rather well-known political consultant of the White House says, this is war, we've got a war room. And I'm just curious if you found the war room between when I started the first draft and read the final remarks, because uh, that's where it sounds like the conspiracy's going on. But uh, I was a little uh, curious, and whoever did write your speech uh, deserves a high payment. Thank you. Uh, because it was well done. Now, I'm not going to ask you if I'm part of the conspiracy or not. I notice a number of my colleagues have asked that. Uh, but I can assure you I'm not part of the conspiracy. And uh, what I'm curious about here is, uh, you know, the basic thing where, where in the law is community opposition listed as a consideration when taking land in trust? Maybe the solicitor can help you on that. Well, no, it's Section 20. It says either community detriment or detriment to the community. I'm okay. not sure which. So you're in you're interpreting detriment to, detriment to the community as the community opposition. The, the decision, I think, uh, the text of, the, uh, of Michael Anderson's decision does a good job of, of explaining detriment to the community. It certainly involves economic detriment, but not exclusively. Uh, it goes to these other issues of congestion, uh, community vision, uh, quality of life, all of those things, I think, are included within the meaning and intention of the word detriment. How about people in the community that just don't like Indians? I happen to like Indians, and I can uh, think that they're clearly denied. does not that, that clearly does not qualify. No. Uh, it was mentioned this morning that uh, I'd stated that material supporting the Hudson application has been left out of the record submitted to the federal court in Wisconsin. Over the lunch break, we reviewed the 14-volume record furnished to the court, and my statements happen to be correct. There are only two pages of the petition signatures in the 14 volumes. There are representations that there are additional 152 pages somewhere else. If they're there, we can't find them. However, the Well, we're getting close. We've at least agreed on two pages. Uh, no, uh, it's uh, more than that. Uh, you do have two pages in there, however. However, the document I gave the secretary earlier shows that uh, this uh, appears to be incorrect. Uh, it is not the place to decide the issue, however. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask <laughs> you send the original document from which I was speaking to the federal court as well as the attorney general's task force we'll so they that. have all of it before them. And we'll leave it to them to worry about. We'll do that. And, and would you would you Mr. yield to me briefly? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Could I could I could I uh, uh, explain in response to the question about uh, did did we submit the full petition? I'm told that Mr. Hartman actually converted the petition signatures in the, that were in handwriting uh, into a computer printout, and that is in the administrative record. Counsel. So the form of the petition that the congressman uh, submitted this morning is in the administrative record. It's just in TypeScript for more legible reading than in handwritten form. I add a minute back on the clock. Counsel, I have told every witness who testified that they uh, are uh, allowed to com communicate with their counsel, but the counsel is not to respond to the committee. You are to uh, respond to your client and uh, he's to respond to the committee. And so if you have an objection or something, I, 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 you're proper to make it, but I wish you would make it through uh, Mr. Babbitt. Let me just say, since we now have uh, back, on, back on the time, you said there was detriment to the community. Let me just say that there was a dog track already there. They had 8,000 parking spots. The estimate was only 4,000 of those parking spots were going to be utilized so that you weren't going to have the the impact that you would have had with the Gant with the horse or the dog track that was already there. The environmental impact study had been approved at the local level. An environmental impact study when the dog track was first put there had, had been approved some time back. So gambling was already in the play, in the area. Now regarding the Im economic impact on the community, the tribes in question had already agreed to give 1.1 or 1.2 million dollars to the local community to take care of the infrastructure problems and the sewage problems and others that might arise. So when you talk about detriment to the community, 
I'd like, to un I'd like to understand what you mean, because there was already a gambling facility there, had 8,000 parking spots, only 4,000 of which were going to be utilized. They'd already reached an agreement with the community on the infrastructure problem by giving them a guarantee they'd pay them for it. So what was the detriment to the community? Mr. Chairman, I, I was watching when you had this dialogue with Michael Anderson last week. Right. And there was a rather thorough discussion of it. I would add only this. I've got to tell you, I don't think it's exclusively for you and me to sit around haggling about detriment to the community. I think the City Council of Hudson, Wisconsin, is the correct presumptive place. There was a current. referendum that passed prior to that, Mr. Secretary. So there's a mixed bag there. Let me just say. There, was a, there may well have been uh, me, changing attitudes was during a, that. But during a, the time that was this was under discussion, was the fact subjective. is that the Hudson City Council had on record a resolution adamantly opposing this application. Four to two. Four to two. That's it correct. Was after the referendum passed. But let me the, just say this to you, Mr. Mr. Secretary. That is a subjective judgment on the part of what we believe to be political appointees who may have been influenced by political contributions. And that's what we're trying to get at. Mr. Duffy, if you read the record and you see that he was involved deeply in the decision-making process, you, Mr. Scabine mentions that in his, in, his, uh, in his memo, which you guys tried to claim, claim privilege on, which we did put in the record and is public in the public domain because the people have a right to know. Mr. Scabine says very clearly, Mr. Duffy, a political appointee who is now benefiting at a law firm by representing one of the prevailing tribes, the Shakopees, he was involved in that decision. And so it's a subjective thing. And it really bothers me that you keep saying, well, it was a detriment to the community when there's no real evidence to that, to verify that. The gentleman, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Thank you. That's all, Mr. Chairman. I think you're absolutely right on the track. Uh, who's next on your I'm side? Next. Oh, this is the second round. Uh, Mr. Barr? Is Mr. Barr? Uh, Mr. Miller? Mr. Miller is recognized. I stand corrected. Mr. Chairman, thank you for yielding. Let me, uh, if I may, yield my time right now to Mr. Barr. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'd like to go back to the, uh, the court opinion uh, to which we were referring to earlier, which is uh, a part of the record, uh, the opinion of, of Judge uh, Crabb in this case. Uh, as I indicated, uh, although there were, is a, a continuing effort to trivialize the opinion, uh, the judge, I think, was very specific and very deliberative in the words that she used. Uh, yes, we all understand, those of us who are familiar with court proceedings, and I know you are, uh, that this document does not re represent the results of a trial on the merits of the case. It comes at a, at a prior time. but. The burden that was to be met by the plaintiffs in this case, that is the, the Indian tribes, uh, the defendants being yourself and the other uh, government officials, was a very high one because they, the plaintiffs, were seeking to go beyond normal discovery proceedings. And uh, the presumption of the court is not to allow that. And that is indeed the judge's initial decision was that uh, at page uh, four, plaintiffs had not met their evidentiary burden and therefore the court granted defendant's motion uh, not to allow more extensive discovery to go into the allegations of improprieties that plaintiffs believed were relevant to their uh, presentation of the case. The court correctly indicated that a strong showing requirement uh, would be necessary before she would rule in plaintiff's behalf. She did that, and the reason that she did that uh, is because she believed after reviewing evidence extensively uh, that the plaintiffs uh, indeed uh, met their burden. And as part of her background, as you can see from reading through the opinion, as I presume you have certainly, uh, she makes some, some very important comments about conspiracy theories. We've been talking about that. and. and by coincidence, the judge addresses that. And she says at the top of page six, six, 
quote, although I am reluctant to accept conspiracy theories of government, it would be naive to think that abuses of power never take place or that government agencies never accede to strong political pressure. Drawing on all reasonable inferences from the undisputed facts in plaintiff's favor, I believe there is a distinct possibility that improper political influence affected Anderson's decision on plaintiff's application, close quote. The court then moves through a detailed analysis of the evidence that sustains her conclusion and plaintiff's request, uh, including uh, possible uh, contacts uh, between John Duffy and others uh, in the Department of the Interior uh, and plaintiffs uh, in February 1995 uh, without notice to the plaintiffs, which is unusual. Not only is it unusual, uh, the government had a duty, she uses that word, a duty uh, to consult with plaintiffs pursuant to 25 U.S.C. section 2719B1A. She concludes, this is not my conclusion, it is the court's. The delay suggests that the department did not contact plaintiffs because it was not interested in allowing plaintiffs to remedy the problems. Later on, she contrasts that with another application in a different case, the Mashantucket Pequot decision, uh, which she believes at the bottom of page eight of her decision is relevant to plaintiffs' attempt, in this case, to show political impropriety. She says that in that case, the Pequot uh, tribe case, the department, that is the Department of the Interior, approved the tribe's application even though there was strong local opposition because the tribe had made a good faith effort to address those concerns. Thus, she says, local opposition is not always fatal to an application like plaintiffs. She finds that the department's willingness in the subsequent decision, that is May 1996, to approve an application that evokes strong local opposition when it found that such local opposition was fatal to plaintiff's application in this case, she found that to be, in her words, disconcerting. She also, at great length, and I would again direct your attention, I know you're familiar with these uh, letters, uh, the meetings reflected in letters and memos with Don Fowler, uh, the Democrat National Committee Chairman, uh, meetings with Harold Ickes uh, in 1995, exhibits we've already seen, exhibits number 310, 311-1, uh, which clearly raised the possibility that political influence did come to bear uh, in this case. So I think the judge, certainly not in anticipation of these hearings, but consistent with these hearings, has raised in her mind through the extensive evidence that she's reviewed the very same questions, the very same concerns, and come to the very same conclusion that this does not pass the smell test. And I would again uh, respectfully urge uh, careful study of the, the judge's ruling. I thank the chair. Uh, Congressman, could I uh, respond to that? I, it's, I certainly have no problem with that. I'm at the court's, uh, at the, uh, at the court's discretion, at the chairman's discretion on, on the timing. Uh, I'm, so. I'm inclined to go through uh, that point by point, but perhaps uh, what I can do. Pardon me. Of course you can resp respond, Secretary. We'll give you all the time you need. Thank you. Um, well, once again, the judge's ruling, as I understand it, is on a motion to expand discovery beyond the written record. And that, in fact, involves a fairly low threshold in which uh, she is uh, viewing uh, the allegations, as she says, in the plaintiffs. We would agree a fairly uh, high uh, burden on those seeking to no, I, I, I would get actually, extensive I would actually discovery. Disagree. I would actually disagree. So okay. fairly low. Well, you and I have a different different reading of the, the yeah. rules of civil procedure. Well, I think procedure. expanding discovery uh, beyond a written record is hardly an unusual thing to do. And of course, that's precisely what has happened here in this committee, and it's precisely what happened in the Thompson Committee. You have had uh, the occasion to make a record of testimony that has nowhere appeared in her court. Now, let me just give you uh, uh, one or two examples. Um, 
the, the opinion talks about the delay in contacting plaintiffs. George Scabine was questioned about that, and he testified in very clear and convincing fashion as to what that was all about. Uh, the Crabb opinion uh, deals with the issue of the Hartman Memorandum. That issue has scarcely been mentioned today, and the reason is that after weeks of bandying about conspiracies over the Hartman Memo, Scabine and Hartman sat side by side and explained what that was about. It didn't keep a couple people here today from once again mischaracterizing it, but the issue has been absolutely, unequivocally laid to rest. Um, Judge Crabb, on the basis of the plaintiff's allegations, um, raises the issue of Ada Deer's disqualification. That was an earlier conspiracy theory being peddled by the Thompson Committee. Ada Deer has testified clearly and unequivocally about her recusal. Now, uh, in aid of the, this committee, you've at least dropped that one. I didn't have to deal with that one today. Now, lastly, um, a word about the Pequot uh, uh, allegation. The fact is that the Nashantucket Pequot Trust issue did not even involve the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. It didn't even apply. It was a piece of land adjacent to the reservation, taken into trust for a parking lot. Well, enough. I just suggest that this committee ought to pay more attention, not to what's being alleged in preliminary discovery in a federal court, but what has been laid out here in extenso for the last four days. I'm, I'm paying attention to, to the words of the United States District Court Judge, Mr. Secretary, and, and I would also note for the record that one piece of evidence that she did not have before her uh, was your subsequent testimony and explanations and Mr. Eckstein's. Yeah. It, Mr. Barr, your time has expired. We'll Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kearney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you for spending the time that you've spent today and answering so candidly uh, to the many questions put before you. Uh, I might just add as a little uh, follow-up on the most recent conversation, that having spent 20 years as a trial lawyer, uh, that I would agree that with your perception that the judge is at a very threshold stage in discovery and with our expanded discovery today, uh, did not have much of a burden to put that matter on for further fact-finding. Uh, and in essence, after having listened to much over the last four days as the facts develop, uh, I don't think that these hearings have necessarily been about putting matters to rest. Uh, you are, Mr. Secretary, by now familiar with the fact that Heather Sibison, a staff member of Interior, was the person who would have had contact, if any, with the White House. That's correct. And uh, at what level of a staff uh, person is Ms. Sibison? Uh, she was hired as an assistant to John Duffy. And do you now know that she was questioned uh, under oath in a deposition some time ago? Uh, I, have, I have read her deposition. And then you've read the part where uh, Ms. Sibison was uh, asked, and I quote, Ms. Sibison, you testified earlier about a conversation or two that you had with Jennifer O'Connor at the White House. And Jennifer O'Connor, of course, was an aide to Harold Ickes, as I understand it. Is it your recollection, Ms. Sibison, that she was merely making a status inquiry into the application? Ms. Sibison answered, that was my understanding, yes. The question again was, and it wasn't that the White House was giving its opinion on the application. And her answer was, that's correct. And the question was, or dictating an outcome? And Ms. Sibison's answer was, she expressed no opinion as to the outcome or made no request regarding the outcome. And the question was, did the White House dictate a date the decision had to be made by? And Ms. Sibison's answer was, absolutely not. The date had absolutely nothing to do with the White House. Now, I just make those quotes, Mr. Secretary, because I understand Ms. Sibison has not and probably will not be called before this committee as a witness, and so I use that as somewhat of the basis of my comment that I think this hearing has been far from putting things to rest. Is that your understanding of the colloquy that went between the questioner of the staff and Ms. Sibison? Uh, th that is my understanding, but there are two parties who could shed light on that, Jennifer O'Connor and Heather Sibison. And neither of them have been called by this committee, is that, that correct? That's my understanding. And to your knowledge, would that have been the only contact with regard to this matter between your department at any level and the White House at any level? I believe that the contacts discussed in the Sibison deposition are, to my knowledge, 
to my knowledge throughout this entire proceeding record and my recollection, the only contact with anyone from the White House. Well, if you'll suffer a couple of comments, Mr. Secretary, it's long been my opinion that the American people really want this committee to spend its time looking into campaign finance reform because not just soft money but hard money and the perception of all of the impact that that may have on our political system is a cause of great concern to the American people. But instead, uh, we choose to spend our time in other ways. Uh, we don't look into the tobacco issue, but we do look into situations where it's a stretch uh, as long as there are Democrats that uh, might be involved. It seems to have come down then to a question of credibility. So if I could close my time out, Mr. Secretary, just by asking you for a little bit of your background, sir. How long have you been in public service? Uh, for approximately 23 years. And uh, at what level did you first uh, begin as a public servant? Um, I was elected uh, Attorney General of Arizona. And how many years did you hold that position? Uh, for about, uh, it was about three years. And what happened after that? <clears throat> uh, my, uh, the, the governor was appointed to become the ambassador to Argentina. Uh, and the lieutenant governor uh, died of a heart attack in the middle of the night, and I was next. <laughs> so you elected your day. So I became governor. Right. And how long did you serve as governor? Uh, for about nine years. How many terms was that? Uh, that'd be two plus. And after you were governor, sir? Uh, I ran in the Democratic uh, primaries in uh, 1987 and 88. For president. President. And after that? Uh, I went home. And now you've recently been serving in the interior, is that yes. correct? All right. Now, during any of those times that you held public office and had to campaign for that office, did you obviously have to uh, get involved with raising funds for your campaign? Yes. Now, sir, at any time that you held any of those public offices, uh, did you ever make a decision with regard to policy based on any matter having to do with contributions made to your campaign during the elections? Not to my recollection, no. And, sir, uh, with regard to the matter that's before the committee these past four days, uh, in any way did any action that you took with regard to this casino issue have to do with contributions made to any individual of the Democratic Party? Well, I did not participate in the decision, and I was not involved in any way uh, in raising, raising funds. Uh, and, in fact, if somebody else wrote that decision for you, is that correct, for the department? Well, yes, I think the record shows that the decision signed by Michael Anderson uh, was drafted uh, by George Cabine and then reworked, to, as, as I understand the record, uh, uh, edited and reworked by John Duffy and various other uh, people who were in the process uh, to uh, work, at, and Michael Anderson for that matter. So if you were going to have any undue influence on the results of those people's work, you would have had to go to each of them and get them to do something that they might not otherwise be inclined to do uh, and then, of course, they've all testified in front of this committee, and we would have heard about it. Is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Secretary, I thank you for your time here today and for your service to the country. Thank you. Yeah, gentlemen's time has expired, Mr. Barr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just very briefly to uh, conclude uh, and finish up uh, the thought in going through the, uh, the court's opinion, uh, the date of the court's opinion is uh, March 19, 1997. Uh, and uh, the date of Mr. Eckstein's deposition, September 30, 1997. So the court obviously did not have before it uh, Mr. Eckstein's deposition, uh, including his uh, references we've already discussed today, found at page 53 of his deposition, uh, that, uh, uh, quote, the secretary said at some point when we were standing up, asked me rhetorically, do you know how much, I be believe it was these tribes, had contributed to either the Democratic Party or Democratic candidates or the DNC. I said, I don't have the slightest idea. And he responded by saying, well, it's on the order of half a million dollars, something like that, close quote. Uh, I suspect that particularly at that portion of the court's uh, opinion at page 8, uh, where she discusses uh, Mr. Eckstein and the uh, inferences and the evidence that suspect her to believe political foul play, would probably not be weakened uh, had this deposition uh, been available to her. It may have been made available since, and I'm not sure. But my only point is that, uh, uh, that, this, uh, that this opinion, uh, based on extensive, though obviously incomplete, since we have additional evidence since the date of this opinion, 
uh, reaches some very disturbing and I think very credible uh, conclusions. Uh, I would uh, 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 yield two minutes to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hastert. Well, the gentleman from Illinois, but I appreciate the gentleman. Gentleman from Illinois. From Georgia, yielding you time. And, uh, just two very, very brief points that I want to make. You know, we talk about the local interest and in, in why people were for or against, and we can number whether there's 69 people for and 72 people against it, pretty close. And, and city council voted for it and against it. But the issue was that there was a whole procedure that they followed in court of section 20, and they were following section 20, that this thing was approved, 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 approved. And all of a sudden, Mr. Skabeen became the administrator in this situation. All of a sudden, he got a message someplace, because he even said it was approved once, and then reached back into another whole section to actually say that this thing is not approved. So there's a real change in course, and uh, I would question that. The second thing I wanted to ask. Could, could I ask a question? Is, is it uh, on the screen think, an exhibit? I think you can you, ask you, a question you, to you the. You cannot ask a question, Mr. Is this Babbitt. an exhibit? You, you cannot ask a question, Mr. Babbitt. Is the one can, can the witness there. refer to what's on the screen? Sir? Well, I uh, would refer to basically uh, the exhibit uh, C-104, if you wish to know. I would like to continue on. You have it. I would like to continue on. Basically, and one other question, uh, sec Secretary, uh, the gentleman from uh, Georgia talked about this discussion. I talked about the discussion that Mr. Eckstein had, the, t the testimony that he gave before Mr. Thompson, which basically said that you thought that the Indians gave within the range of a half a million dollars, and that was important. Do you want me to reread it? You know what we're talking about. You don't want me to reread that, do you? I don't need to do that. I mean, the basis of the question is, you know, we said maybe we got caught up in white lies today. The, the other side mentioned that several times. We said, well, maybe that happened. If the fact that, the, that there was truthful uh, testimony by Mr. Uh, Eckstein, how did you know it was a half a million dollars? Somebody had to tell you. Well, I've, I know you didn't remember that, but if in fact I've he's testified that I've testified that I have no recollection of that discussion. But don't you think that's a, a uncanny coincidence? How would he have known if somebody had like you hadn't told him? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Uh, I think the question stands for itself. I understand why you don't understand the question. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, for the record, since. Um, we have uh, indicated uh, the various background of various individuals to whom we've been referring. I'd like for the record to note that Mr. Eckstein, who gave a sworn deposition, including portions of that I read just a few moments ago under oath, uh, is a, uh, according to his bio, a lifelong registered Democrat, uh, one of those uh, bioed in the Best Lawyers in America reference book, Harvard Law School uh, 65. He was a co-prosecutor of Arizona, former Arizona Governor Evan Meekham uh, in the impeachment. He is a managing partner of a major Phoenix law firm uh, and uh, has a very, very extensive and very distinguished career as uh, has the secretary. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, since we have referred to uh, statements that he has made under oath uh, and used his name today, I want the record to reflect uh, the man's distinguished background so that there's no inference that because nobody has referred to his distinguished background, his testimony under oath would be uh, suspect. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Uh, I, you had an additional 30 seconds because of counsel's interruption. Did you I'd want uh, to yield that to the gentleman from California, Mr. Horn? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and Mr. Secretary. Your counsel has to be charitable about it. Misrepresented the record in terms of that document. I said we were going to refer to the court and did not. We got the document finally, and what is in the court's binder is not that document. And here's the difference. 797 cards, letters, and petition signatures are on that computerized document to which your counsel, the Solicitor of Interior, I think, uh, referred. And we have in the original document, which is not in the court record, 1,413 petition signatures. In other words, Council is saying it was all the same, 
and it's just some were typed and Xeroxed and whatnot, and some were in hand. And that means 616 people were left out. And uh, I don't particularly appreciate that misrepresentation. And I'd like, Mr. Chairman, if I might, unanimous consent that this part of the record go right after the incident that I recall when the lawyer advised the cabinet officer and misrepresented it. Without objection, so ordered. I'm told by staff that Mr. Hartman, who, who had the, the handwritten signatures converted to TypeScript, eliminated duplicate signatures. Counsel. Those at the 716 or however many there were taken out were actually uh, in there twice. Counsel, I don't know if you understand what I said a while ago, but I want to refresh your memory. If Mr. Babbitt wants to respond, that's fine, and you're at liberty to tell Mr. Babbitt that Mr. Babbitt can respond to the committee. You are not a sworn witness, so if you have something to say, I hope you'll say it through your client. Reserving the right to object Mr. to the unanimous consent request so I can ask a gentlemen, question gentlemen about will it. State his it. Was it the request that we place some document in a particular place in the record? Is that what you suggested? No, I just simply want this addition that it was misrepresentation put after the incident when we were exchanging comments. You want to put something in the record that there was misrepresentation? I'm talking about the fact that the council misrepresented the document and uh, said, oh, we've got everything in the record. Well, they don't have everything well, I, in the record. They need the original document in the record, and that's all we're asking. I, 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 I don't understand what your unanimous request is. To do what? He's asking Take that the original document of the, be put the record, record, including your remarks right now, and put it back where the issue came up. And now, if the, the council... Right to, reserving the right to object, may I... I I'm still recognizing my reservation. If, if be, I might before you object, may I... Sir, too. I mean, if you're going to object, I'd like to make a gentleman from California has a reservation on that. I'm trying to understand what the request is, and you want to put some some document in the record, but you've claimed that it it, it uh, provides evidence in some way there is a misrepresentation by counsel. That's your conclusion. But then, if we're going to say that, then we ought to have the opportunity for counsel to insert some statement in the record in response to it, since he's being uh, denied the opportunity here. Would no, the gentleman counsel, agree to that? No. Council did respond to it, claiming that they had dropped the duplicates. And all I'm saying is that was not the original discussion. The original discussion was everything's there, but some of it's typed up and uh, well, put together. I, uh, if the gentleman would, would, would suspend, let me just say I think we can resolve this by saying that I think this part of the record will reflect the discussion and the entire document will be placed in the record at, at this point. Uh, obviously, we'd like to have it in earlier, but if Mr. Waxman objects, it'll be put in the record anyhow. You object? If not, it'll be in the record uh, at this point. Uh, well, it doesn't make much difference whether I object or not, it looks like. Uh, I, I'm going to object to the unanimous consent request. If you want to put something in the record, go ahead and see if you can do it, uh, if you think it fits in the record. But uh, it seems to me that we ought to be fair and give, uh, if we're going to put something in the record with accusations, we ought to let somebody be able to re respond in the record to give their point of view. And, and I don't know why the gentleman from California would be unwilling to go along with that. He could put his point of view in there He's got and the document and then let the council put a statement in there. Right, and, and that's that discussion we're just having now would simply be moved several paragraphs back and put with the other discussion. But it doesn't matter to me if you want to just leave it here. It's just that people could read that part of the record and think that's the end of that. And what I'm saying is I'd like a complete part of the record where it's all together. Yeah. <coughs> I object. Okay, It'll be entered it in the record at this then. point then. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. Uh, who's the next on your side? Yeah, I'm next. Mr. Waxman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've uh, been back and forth between this committee and another one where we're looking at tobacco policy. You said the Commerce Committee was looking at campaign finance investigations. Of course, they're not. And I've been very involved in that issue, so I'm going to have to uh, be over there a good part of the time. So I want to I want to make some concluding statements on, uh, of my own on this whole uh, investigation. Uh, recently, the New Republic magazine uh, analyzed the culture of investigation. Their story entitled "Prosecutorial Indiscretion and the Criminalization of Politics." Uh, they made the obvious point: we should expose corruption and wrongdoing, and we all agree with that. But the article. Martical's main point is that we have a criminalization of our politics and government. We now focus on the insignificant and not real corruption. I think Justice Scalia, and I think I'm fair in uh, recalling his 
statement on the issue of the legal of the independent counsel. He argued that we used to have crimes and then we try to find out who committed them. Now we have individuals and we try to find out if they committed a crime. I, I think it's absolutely clear to me that there was extensive lobbying on this issue of this Hudson dog track being turned into a casino. And it's clear to me that, there, that this is true on almost every issue we have in Washington, whether it's debated in the Congress, debated in the Department of Interior, or anywhere else where the decision is going to be made. But the key point, however, is that political contributions did not influence the Hudson Casino decision. That decision was made on the merits, and political pressure did not affect the decision-making process or those who actually made the decision. I think that's absolutely key, key, and we should not lose sight of it. We have one other peculiar factor in this case, and that is the meeting Secretary Babbitt had with Mr. Eckstein. And Secretary Babbitt clearly could have, and I think should have, handled this meeting in a better way. He's embarrassed about it, and I think appropriately. But we ought not to be appointing independent councils for clumsy behavior. We shouldn't be holding meetings of Congress, four meetings of Congress, on something that didn't amount to anything. Uh, I think that um, Mr. Babbitt has had to own up to his embarrassment in this situation. And I think that uh, is uh, the price you have to make sometime for things you did that you, in retrospect, might have handled differently. But it would be a travesty if we had an independent counsel in this matter, as some people have suggested. It seems to me that there's no grounds for an independent counsel, but a lot of people now want independent counsels for everything, particularly uh, on the Republican side of the aisle. And it seems that it would be a more appropriate punishment, which has already been exacted, that uh, Mr. Uh, Babbitt, as Secretary of Interior, have to participate <coughs> in this hearing, as he did in the Senate hearing, as he may have to in the Natural Resources Committee hearing, and have to answer over and over and over again uh, about uh, how he handled uh, that, uh, that uh, statement to uh, Mr. Eckstein. That uh, is an appropriate uh, penalty for clumsiness. But I don't think clumsiness is the same thing as doing anything criminal. I want to. Uh, I wanted to make those points. I want to make them very clearly. I, I, I think we have a lot of questions right now about what independent councils ought to be doing when they're appropriate, when they're not. In my view, it would be absolutely a travesty to have one under this situation. Nothing criminal has been, even credible evidence has been established. In my opinion, I yield to Mr. Kanjorski. Uh, Mr. Tucker, are you clairvoyant? <laughs> no. Well, it seems that your uh, former uh, law partner and law school buddy thought you were clairvoyant because in, in July of 1995, when he had that meeting in your office, he claims that you rhetorically asked the question, do you have any idea what these tribes contribute to the Democrats? And then he recalls that you said $500,000. That's very interesting because you had to be clairvoyant, clairvoyant for almost a year to a year and a half under the majority member's memo of contribution of these Indian tribes to the Democratic National Committee, the overwhelming amount of the $350,000 was made more than 15 months after that meeting. Now, Mr. Eckstein either is exceptionally clairvoyant, or you're clairvoyant, or Mr. Eckstein is recalling information two years after a statement was made based on relatively recent information that he could have put together through the FEC records, because no contributions other than a very small minimal amount of several hundred dollars had been made by these tribes to any Democratic functionary in that cycle prior to the meeting held in your office. Uh, no, I, I simply do not recollect this discussion, which has now been alleged more than <clears throat> brought uh, forward more than
two years later. I've, I've listened very carefully to the allegation. I'm still not certain because as I was listening once again to the deposition, it seemed to me he was not clear in his rendition what tribes, and I think his rendition was in the past tense, but I would have to go back to the deposition to hear that. The gentleman's time has expired. I'll take my time now. Mr. Uh, Paul Eckstein, I I'm going to give you my summary of this thing the way I view it. Mr. Eckstein testified under oath that Secretary Babbitt told him that Harold Ickes wanted the decision made without delay. Mr. Eckstein also testified that Secretary Babbitt asked him if he knew how much money the Indian tribes had donated to the DNC and told him it was about a half a million dollars. Now, on July the 13th, a law partner, Mr. Schneider, Mr. O'Connor, who was a lobbyist for the majority tribes, the tribes that won, the Shakopees and others, uh, raised $420,000. wasn't two years later. It was within a short period of time after that, $420,000. Mr. Eckstein has never wavered from his account of the events. Mr. Babbitt at first said that neither accusation was true. He said it wasn't true flat out at first. A year later, he changed his story. Well, I, I obviously disagree with that Mr. characterization. Let me just register my disagreement with that characterization. Let's put the time back on the clock. This is not a question, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Eckstein has never wavered from his account of the events. Mr. Babbitt at first said, according to Mr. Eckstein, that neither, or Mr. Babbitt said at first that neither accusation was true. A year later, he changed his story. He said that he did invoke Harold Dickey's name, but that he wasn't tell, telling the truth. But he doesn't recall the comment about the half a million dollars. He recalls half of his statement. On the day that the rejection was issued, on the day that the rejection was issued, the lead lobbyist for the wealthy opposing tribes noted in his billing records that he needed to get together with Harold Ickes at the White House to discuss fundraising strategies. The day that the rejection was issued, over 18, over the next 18 months, in addition to the $420,000 that Mr. Schneider raised, the seven wealthy tribes that opposed the casino at uh, Hudson uh, contributed over $350,000 to the DNC. There's a great deal of evidence to suggest that Harold Ickes did have an interest in the matter, which lend credibility to Mr. Eckstein's statement. Mr. Ickes' assistant called Mr. Babbitt's assistant three times to get information about this application. Mr. Ickes was lobbied twice about the dog track by Tom Schneider, a close friend of the president's and a major Democrat fundraiser. Mr. Ickes told Mr. Schneider he would follow up on it. On May 17th, the applicant tribes met with Interior Department staff and were not informed of any problems with the application. That night, a group of staff had a private meeting that night and decided that the application would not be approved. The next day, Mr. Ickes got a memo from his assistant informing him that Interior was virtually certain to reject the application. This was two months before the decision was issued. Mr. Ickes was clearly being kept informed as the process moved forward. Why? If Mr. Ickes wasn't in, in the loop, why was he asking in for, for information about this? Mr. Babbitt. Uh, said that uh, said he told Mr. Eck or Mr. Eckstein said Babbitt told him that uh, it was because uh, Ickes was interested. Uh, Mr. Babbitt said that that was a made-up story. Nevertheless, Mr. Ickes did get a memo two months before the decision was made public. In April 1995, Patrick O'Connor, the lead lobbyist for the wealthy tribes, personally lobbied the president on the dog track issue in Minneapolis. Bruce Lindsay, one of the president's most trusted advisors, called from Air Force One to a White House staffer to, and told him to return O'Connor's calls. The White House staffer wrote a very strong memo stating that this was very risky and uh, political poison. Patrick O'Connor and his partners lobbied Schneider and his partner uh, Schneider lobbied the president, Ickes, Don Fowler of the DNC, Harry McAuliffe, the chief fundraiser for the Clinton-Gore campaign, the Minnesota delegation, and Vice President Gore's most trusted advisors. Mr. O'Connor and Larry Kiddo sent a letter out, and I'll quote from the letter. As witnessed in the fight to stop the Hudson dog track proposal, the office of the president can and will work on our behalf when asked to do so. And this was a fundraising letter for both the president and the vice president asking for a thousand bucks from these tribes, from individuals in the tribes, for each one of those people, the president and the vice president. The Justice Department lawyer who was representing the Interior Department in the civil suit wrote in a memo that he had reviewed the entire administrative record. The department had not followed its own procedure or law, and he recommended that they settle the lawsuit. The Interior Department never consulted with the applicant tribes to give them a chance to correct any flaws in their application, and that's required by law, and they didn't do it. 
The department extended the comment period on the application for two months and kept it a secret from the applicant tribes. The federal judge overseeing the civil suit ruled that there was considerable evidence of improper political interference. We've received eight sworn affidavits attesting that George Scabine, the career employee in charge of the Indian gaming staff, met with a group of supporters of the casino in Wisconsin in 1996 and told them that the career staff wanted to approve the application, but when it got to the political appointees, they rejected it. Now, he said differently here, but this is sworn by eight people. Two of Secretary Babbitt's senior staffers, Tom Collier, his chief, Tom Collier, his chief of staff, and his counsel, John Duffy, left the department and got lucrative positions at his former law firm, one of whom was there before, representing the wealthiest of the tribes, the Shakopees, that benefited from the decision to reject the casino. John Duffy was one of the key decision makers, as the evidence clearly shows. Five times Career Interior Department staff wrote lengthy, detailed reports stating there was no evidence of detriment to the local community. Yet Michael Anderson, the political appointee who signed the rejection letter, cited detriments to the local community. And we've, I think, proved here that that wasn't the case. When George Scabine was deposed, he conceded there was no evidence of concrete detriments to the local community and that the application could not be rejected based on the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. The dog track was already there. There was already a gambling facility there. It had already been approved by the local community. It had passed environmental muster. And yet they said that it was going to be a detriment to the community, even though the Indian tribes had made a deal with the community to give $1.1 million to take care of the infrastructure problems. Last week, Fred Havenick told, testified that Terry McAuliffe, the top Clinton Gore finance person, told him, inadvertently I might add, that he had killed the deal. While Mr. McAuliffe had apparently denied Mr. Havenick's representations, Mr. O'Connor did testify to discussing fundraising with Mr. McAuliffe, and O'Connor's billing records reflect discussions of fundraising strategies with Ickes, Fowler, and McAuliffe on the day that the application was rejected. No evidence, all circumstantial. In a May 25, 1995 memo, a lobbyist for the opposing tribes, a lobbyist for the opposing tribes, wrote that the career people including Michael Anderson, with whom he met on May 22nd, wanted to, quote, keep the issue on the merits, but things might change when the politicians like Babbitt and Duffy become involved, but without the law on their side, it will be difficult to kill the deal. That is a statement from a lobbyist trying to kill the deal himself, who met with Michael Anderson, who eventually signed the letter. Even the lobbyist opposing this deal didn't think the law was on his side. This is just some of the information. And so I hope that there is an independent counsel that looks into this. Now. You talk about criminal activity. Maybe there is no criminal activity, but the appointment of an independent counsel is not just to prove criminal activity, it's to investigate the alleged, alleged uh, 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 criminal activity. And, and we have enough evidence, I think, here in these hearings to prove beyond any doubt whatsoever that there ought to be somebody to investigate this very thoroughly. We cannot indict anybody in this body. All we can do is expose the information to the American people, and that's what we're trying to do. But the independent counsel or the Justice Department needs to look into this to see if there was criminal activity because a poor Indian tribe was hurt while a large and wealthy <coughs> Indian tribe was not hurt. Mr. Chairman. Uh, no, just a second. I'll finish. I'll give you ex extra time. And, 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 and it, if there was a miscarriage of justice, if there was a miscarriage of justice, it needs to be corrected. And those who broke the law, if there was a law broken, need to be held accountable. This is a nation of laws and not of men. And I know the people who've come before this body have said time and again, we didn't do anything wrong. But there certainly is enough question here that the American people ought to demand a thorough investigation by the Justice Department or an independent counsel. Now, who's next on your side? Ms. Maloney. Mr. Thanks. Chairman, you've just repeated at great length the very same things that you said at the beginning of this hearing. All I can say is if you're bound on a conspiracy and oblivious to the facts, uh, I hardly know where to begin. But uh, the record of this proceeding is absolutely at variance uh, with the allegations you just made. Well, we'll see. Um, Mr. Chairman, that was a, a fine statement you made, yet the evidence that we gathered in the past four days of hearings contradicts practically everything you said. The evidence that's on the record here that was gathered by this committee's hearings. And I, I just uh, 
want to put in the record the majority member's memo on, uh, quote, contributions and add my voice to Mr. Konjorski's at the meeting with Mr. Epstein. All of these contributions came in afterwards. How was he, how did he know that this was going to happen? Was he a clairvoyant, as he said? And I'd like to raise a, a particular person's name who's been raised many times today, and I raise it because he happens to be a former constituent from the district that I am honored to represent, and that is uh, Mr. Harold Ickes. And I just want to make it very crystal clear, uh, Mr. Secretary, and I want to ask you one last time, you've answered many times, but I want to be very clear. Harold Ickes never contacted you either directly or indirectly, personally, or through staff on the Hudson Casino matter. Is that correct? That is correct. Secondly, and neither he nor anyone else in the White House gave you instructions on the timing or substance of the Hudson Casino matter. That is correct. Now, I'd like to go back to a point that uh, some of my Republican colleagues have raised over and over and over again today. Uh, the Republicans have tried to make the case that the lower level career employees thought there wasn't enough proof that the project would be detrimental to the community to rely on Section 20. But with the political community, the business leaders expressing the belief that the project will be detrimental to their community, isn't there a strong presumption that it would indeed be detrimental, Mr. Secretary? Well, I believe the record shows that detriment within the meaning of Section 20 and uh, to the extent that's applied to the Indian Reorganization Act is a great deal more than simply a uh, calculator analysis of, of economic, economic detriment. And I believe that that's at the center of the discussion uh, that clearly went on uh, in May and June in this process is uh, attempting to reach a consensus about the meaning of detriment. Now, my view of this uh, was, is, and will continue to be that detriment is measured in terms of economic loss, in terms of perceptions uh, about uh, uh, traffic, uh, the nature of the community, quality of life, and all of the other issues that are Mr. obviously Secretary, on the minds of the local leaders when they opposed it. Mr. Secretary, the point that I think is one of the most important is the fact that the elected representatives on all levels of government, city, state, federal, the entire Wisconsin delegation, Republican and Democratic, the Minnesota delegation, opposed the project. Now, I would never venture to speak for uh, another member of Congress or for the Wisconsin or Minnesota delegation, but I can speak for the New York delegation. And I can tell you that if the Department of Interior had overruled the unanimous bipartisan position of the New York delegation, you would have never heard the end of it. We would have had you and the President down in our communities in New York State reviewing and talking to the people, explaining why some bureaucrat overruled their opinion. To me, that's very important. People represent a point of view. They re represent people. And these people were saying they didn't want it. So I asked Mr. Chairman, what is the fuss about? What is the fuss about? We have a project that everyone was uniformly opposed to except for a tribe that was 185 miles away that was partnered with a casino developer from Florida. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about every level of government, environmental problems, all kinds of problems. And I can tell you, Mr. Secretary, with all uh, due respect, if your agency had ruled against the express opinion of the New York delegation, we would have taken the issue to the floor of Congress. And I believe that our brothers and sisters in Congress, both Democratic and Republican, would have joined with us in a vote to protect the interest and the opinion of the people that are affected, the people from the district where the casino was 
proposed. And I must tell you, this is very personally important to me because I confront the same situation now in my own district. Someone is trying to bring in gambling into my district, and my constituents uniformly are telling me they don't want it. And, uh, and I feel when the, we have a democracy, the people spoke through their mayor, through their governor, through their, uh, uh, their city council, through their state representatives, through their members of Congress. They said, please don't do it to us. We don't want it. You did what the people said. I can't imagine how you could come up with another opinion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do not understand what the fuss is about. He listened to the delegation, and I can tell you, if he hadn't listened to the delegation, it would have gone to the floor of Congress, and we would have reversed it in a vote on the floor of Congress. I'd be, my time is up, Mr. Chairman. I have a few more questions. I have a lot more I'd like to get off my chest on this, uh, particularly since I am confronting the same problem right now as we speak your back time, in my district your, in New York. Your time has long past expired, but we may be having a second round. We're still working that out. I'm going to do my five minutes uh, because I haven't had a chance to do my five minutes yet. And I would like first on the screen, one of the things that we've heard steadily today and the access influence on the Hudson decision is uh, that the uh, poor Indian tribes had this tremendous lobbying power. And I want to make it clear that it was not an equal balance, that both sides, at least the applicants, had some access and quite a bit early on with the interior staff. They did have a basic, uh, you didn't make it meeting with Secretary Babbitt and a meeting uh, at that point with John Duffy. When you look at the list of who the opponents contacted, it is not a balanced list, and it was not a balanced lobbying effort. Now, but my understanding, uh, Mr. Secretary, is, is that you're saying that the contacts that are political on, that the opponents made, you did not respond to, and you don't know anybody in your department who responded to those contacts. Is that correct? In other words... I, 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 I think we have to be careful about political. For example, uh, there was a meeting with the Minnesota delegation. Uh, White, that is I don't, <coughs> clearly uh, I don't, political. I mean, they're congressmen. I, I, the names I have on there are all White House uh, and Democratic National Committee. I'm not talking about the congressmen. Um, and that uh, my understanding of your testimony today has been that the, you did not deal with any of these people, and these people did not influence your decision directly, correct? This lobbying was going on outside the process. Prior to Hudson, did the White House ever comment to you or anyone in your department on another gambling decision that was pending in your department? Well, no one here commented to me on this decision. On, on any other Indian gambling decision, did anybody at the White House comment to you in advance of a decision? I don't recall. I'd have to go back and look and check, but I do not recall any such uh, comment. So you you will not say categorically that you've never been influenced, or ha the White House has never attempted to contact you well, prior to it. There may have there, there there may well have been status checks, but on beyond a status check. Okay, let me make it more specific. Uh, beyond status checks, I'm quite confident that there have not been any other contacts on any gaming issues. So you status checks, I'd have to. So yeah, you've never made an off-reservation gaming decision based on direction from the White House? Oh, that's absolutely the case. And you I have never, never, this department has never made a, an off-reservation decision uh, that was, uh, to my knowledge, influenced in any way by uh, what was going on outside the process at the White House or anywhere else. In any way includes timing. You've never made an Indian gambling decision based on timing besides Hudson. Not that I'm aware of. Um, if I could have on the screen... Will the gentleman yield one moment uh, in, in regard to the uh, description on the screen? Uh, as long as it, it doesn't count on my Yeah, if we'll, we'll, we can agree it won't count your time. Is that an exhibit that somebody prepared by uh, outside knowledge and some factual information, or is this your exhibit? Um, this is based, I, I ask it to be developed, of what contacts have come up during the period. Right, and I'm reading opponents and, and applicants. And I see uh, Terry uh, uh, McAuliffe is listed on the opponents. And if my best recollection, Mr. Havernick uh, brought his name in, that he talked to him at a fundraiser in Florida at Mr. Berlin's uh, yeah, he, fundraiser. He, so why isn't he on the applicant side? 
what, what, because, what, what, because Mr. McAuliffe had inside information that the uh, decision was turned down, and he talked to Mr. Havnick because he thought that he would be pleased. Well, to I, I thought this said access and, we also and influence. We also the access here was by Mr. the McCall dog track Look, owner Mr. to uh, McAuliffe. Mr. piece of false information to Mr. Havnick, which was the Delaware North information that could have only come from Patrick O'Connor, which meant that McAuliffe was talking with O'Connor. It is impossible that the opponents weren't trying to influence Terry McAuliffe. He only had factual misinformation. I claim back. Yeah. I understand what you're trying to say, but I did have a reason. Well, I just wanted to put the point that Mr. McAuliffe in the newspaper has disclaimed ever having had this discussion with Mr. Havoc, so that we're going to be allowed to put any imaginary list names or people here uh, to suggest a, a access? I would suggest we had several situations that showed that Terry McAuliffe at least had information, if not direct influence. But I, I just wanted to make the point it hasn't been balanced. I wanted to look at Exhibit 296A6. Um, Mr. Secretary, did you know lobbyist Patrick O'Connor, who testified before us yesterday? Yes. Um, you're aware that he was involved in fundraising for your 1988 presidential campaign? Um, uh, my recollection is that uh, Patrick O'Connor was probably asked to help qualify us uh, in Minnesota. Um, I'm not aware of whether or to what extent he did, but I'm sorry. I suspect he was asked to qualify us in Minnesota. By qualifying, you mean getting the federal matching, to get federal correct. matching funds, which is fundraising. Is that right. not correct? Um, do you um, recall any contacts that Mr. O'Connor had with you or your staff on this Hudson Casino? Do I recall any contact with you know of any? Pat O'Connor in the Hudson thing? Uh, I have had no contact with Patrick O'Connor in the course of the Hudson issue. Okay, thank you. In the now I wanted to ask a couple questions regarding the July 14th meeting you had with Mr. Eckstein. Um, do you recall discussing the meeting with anyone at that time? I do not. Uh, before, what about after? I do not. Um, with whom have you discussed the meeting uh, to date? Did you tell Mr. Ickes that you raised his name at any point until it hit the media? I, I did not. Did you discuss it with White House counsel prior to coming here today? I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Um, in trying to sort out with whom you've discussed this meeting, obviously the whole world, you just cut it to some degree with the hearings, but I wondered who you may have had particular discussions with regarding the Eckstein meeting. Did you talk about it with White House counsel, and if so, when did uh, Mr. Ickes, other political uh, people at the White House? Um, I have uh, discussed, I believe I've probably discussed this with uh, uh, with Erskine Bowles, the Chief of Staff. Uh, and when would that have been? Uh, probably when these proceedings be, began this past fall. But you didn't, uh, did you have any discussions before you knew this was going to be Senate and House hearings about uh, the meeting? Uh, no, I don't believe so. And did you believe Mr. Eckstein would just kind of drop it? You didn't realize that by saying something that explosive it would potentially uh, ricochet around? Uh, I don't recall any discussions prior to uh, this past fall as these issues became, uh, uh, came up. Yep. Um, yeah. uh, the contribution issue, for example, never was raised publicly until this past fall. Could you describe briefly what you might have discussed with Erx and Bowles, Mr. Bowles? Sure. Uh, I discussed uh, very briefly my uh, uh, <coughs> It was, it was a discussion in response to uh, what appeared uh, in the newspaper, uh, and uh, I uh, discussed uh, the issue very briefly. He, uh, he asked me whether I had spoken to, ever spoken to Ickes, and I said, no, I have not. And uh, that's the last discussion I've, I've had. Did you ever discuss the McCain letter or your testimony as, as you have clarified and to some degree changed uh, through that process? Did you discuss with White House counsel or anybody, uh, anybody in the political affairs? Uh, I have not discussed, apart from the one meeting with Erskine Bowles. Uh, I'm just trying, I'm slowing down because I think it was right on the front end of this, and I certainly, I probably must have dis discussed the McCain 
letter. This was uh, my response to Senator McCain. I probably discussed with him, uh, and, uh, and and he asked me whether or not I'd spoken to Vicky's. I said no, and that was it. Anybody else at the meeting? Uh, I believe Mr. Ruff was at the meeting, White House Counsel. And you say it was a short meeting? Was it like five minutes, 15 minutes? Yeah, probably five minutes. At the White House? Yes. I thank you for your testimony. Do um, any other members uh, seek time? Uh, Mr. This, uh, this would be the second round. Rather than saying we're having a second round, I just want to see if any other members uh, seek time. Uh, this would be in addition to your first five minutes. We've concluded the first round. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Babbitt, I, uh, you know, I, I know you ran for president, but um, my interest uh, in you came when you were, your name was uh, mentioned for a possible uh, Supreme Court uh, appointment. It was just mentioned, and I, and I know that in order for you to uh, get to that point, I would have to agree with my Republican colleagues, Mr. Barr, who called you a very distinguished person, and Mr. Hastert, who went to great lengths to talk about your distinguished uh, career. Um, for you to get to that point, um, that means that you have had a lifetime of credibility. And not only as a lawyer, um, we who have never been considered for the Supreme Court or even mentioned uh, have to admire people like you. I think one of the things that concerns me is in this process, as I sat here and I listened to your testimony, um, it pains me that this, this process that we're going through um, I hope that it does not taint your career for the rest of your life, because that's real. We have one life to live, and this is no dress rehearsal, and this is that life. Um, and it does, it pains me to think that, 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 thy, that there's a possibility that that might be the case, but I want to go to what you did apparently do wrong. And I think Mr. Waxman was absolutely correct when he talked about no criminal activity here, but he talked about how you made, I think, a mistake. I really do. When Mr. Eckstein, and I understand that you all were buddies, is that right? Good friends. Am I right? Well, we certainly. Yes, you were friends. And um, can I take you back just for a moment to that day? Because I, got, I have a feeling in listening to all of this that you might not be here if it were not for that one meeting. You might not. Was that an appointment that you had with Mr. Eckstein that day? Uh, no, it was not. Can you tell us what happened? How did he get to your office that day? Well, he had uh, been meeting. Uh, he had come to meet with John Duffy uh, and uh, the staff to uh, make one final plea for his client. And uh, sometime after that, he simply called my secretary uh, and asked to come and see me. And it was just that simple. So, so you, and I guess if you were to go back, I don't want Mr. Waxman to be the person who describes how you felt about that day, but I guess if you could relive that moment, you would do things a little bit differently, wouldn't you? Yeah, I think so. I think I would, yeah. You know, I'm reading this book right now, Mr. Secretary. It's uh, by Carson, this fellow Carson, and it's entitled, don't sweat the small stuff. And one of the things that it says in that book is that it is very important to be able to admit your mistakes and to, to, to admit them and, and move on. Um, the mistake that you made here does not call, and I agree with Mr. Waxman, does not call for an independent counsel. You were apparently trying to get a friend out of the office, trying to keep some distance in the, all of this decision-making process because you your buddy was in the office. And, you know, it, it, it frightens me that in, uh, in our nation today, there seems to be an effort at destroying people. And that really does bother me. It really does. Um, and I'm hoping that we can get beyond that, because I think you did make a mistake. I think you've admitted to that mistake. And I think you're sorry for the mistake you did make. Am I right? 
Yes. Now let me go on to another thing that is very interesting. The other side seems to be concerned about you using the word conspiracy. But if you think about why we're here today, this seems to be what it's all about, or we wouldn't be here. And the thing that I guess bothers me is that we have to discount the testimony of the people who testified before us last week, career employees, in order for there to be a conspiracy. You see, Mr. Mr. Uh, Secretary, there's a disconnect here. And the disconnect comes where, you know, you can, we can look at all the circumstantial evidence we want to look at, but the disconnect comes when we have those folks like Mr. Skibine and the other ones that testified last week that clearly stated that they were insulted that anyone would even think and let alone say that they had been improperly influenced in this process. And so we have to basically disregard all of that testimony and have to almost conclude that they're not telling the truth. And that bothers me because I have, I mean, I practiced law for 20 years and I sat here and I listened to them carefully and I feel and I believe very strongly that they are good people just as you are a great man and I, you know, I'm just hoping that this process does not go to a point where an independent counsel is called for because I think such a thing would be overshooting and we would be going much too far and I think it's clear that as Ms. Maloney said that if you had done anything else you would have been in big trouble, big, big trouble. And so I want to thank you for your service. I appreciate it. Thank Gen you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Shaddy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I too want to thank you for your service. And I, I suppose I want to begin this round of questioning by simply make, making it very clear for the record that your service as governor of Arizona was a distinguished one. Um, and that while we may have disagreed on many occasions on philosophical issues, uh, your tenure was characterized by uh, uh, nothing but the highest of integrity uh, and honesty. Uh, and, and I believe that to be true of your entire public service career. Uh, I want to turn to a small point at first and hopefully clarify it. The decision in this case to deny trust status was not based on the fact that the governor opposed trust status or opposed the gambling permit, was it? Uh, the, the fact that the governor opposed it, I think, was not a significant factor. I think we considered his opposition as equivalent to that of other elected officials. It's not cited in the letter. That's, that's correct, because that really is step two, and I don't think that it's particularly good decision-making to anticipate what the go how the governor might use his, uh, shall we call it, veto power. In this case, you really didn't get to step two. You turned it down based on, in the final version, both IGRA and your own discretion, and those are the reasons you didn't get to the question of does the governor oppose it or doesn't he, correct? That's, except to the, to the extent that he's an elected official voicing an opinion, but not in terms of his veto power, no. This decision was based on reasoning, right? Not uh, just a fact, not just the fact that the governor opposed it, it was a reasoned decision. It yes. said IGRA stops this, and in your opinion, discretion also stops it, right? Yes. Okay. My only point, and it's a small one, and, and I'd like to move on to some other comments, but Earlier this morning, you were asked about uh, comments that this decision lacked reasoning and was only three pages long, where earlier decisions had been 29 pages long. And you cited Secretary Lujan's decision in a prior case, and your counsel pulled out of a notebook very quickly, literally ripped it out, a one-page decision dated January 23rd, 1992, by Secretary Lujan turning down uh, a licensing request and said, well, here's an example of where it got turned down in one page. And I simply want to make the point, and your counsel has that letter and you had it with you, this decision is based on one ground and one ground only. There is no reasoning. And that ground is the governor of the state opposed it. And IGRA uh, specifically says that you may only grant it if the governor agrees. And when the governor doesn't agree, there's no reasoning, you must turn it down. So the two are quite different. One requires reasoning, one requires simply the fact that the governor opposed it. Isn't that correct? No, I don't think this was ever sent to the governor for uh, concurrence. Well, I'll read you a sentence from the letter. In the governor of Iowa have stated their strong opposition, yes. Let me just read you the sentence out of the letter. In addition, this is the uh, third paragraph of the letter, uh, last sentence. In addition, the National Ending Gaming Regulatory Act 
requires the concurrence of the governor of Iowa for any such acquisition. And as already noted, the governor opposes the acquisition. I think that ends the inquiry. So I don't think the two are comparable. Um, if having just made that point, I think one's oh. reasoning, one's just a fact. Okay, I, I would make this point in, in response. Uh, he points out in paragraph two, he says the affected community have stated their strong opposition to the project. But we really didn't base it on that. Here he says. Oh, I believe he did. No, he says the gov. He says the law says if the governor opposes it, then we can't grant it, and that's the reason he gives. And it's it, there's no reasoning involved. I, I I I don't agree with that. He says I have decided to deny the request. Having cited the fact, the law does say if the governor opposes it, you have to turn it down. You agree with me on that? No. You don't no. agree that the law says? The, the, the law clearly says, in my judgment, that once the department Let me read makes the law. a decision, then the governor has the right. I'll read you uh, United States Code, uh, Title 25, Section 2719B1A. Uh, the entire sentence I won't read, but it says, the secretary may approve, but only if the governor of the state in which the gaming activity is to be conducted in the secretary's determination. You may only approve it if he agrees. I, uh, Congressman, I, I, I disagree with that. I think that that says that the secretary determines and the governor then either concurs or does not concur. And if the governor does not concur, then it must be denied. The secretary must make a determination and send it to the governor. And, and it, the governor then, as I said earlier, has, after that fact, a separate power that's equivalent to a veto power. I think the sentence says it differently, but we'll leave it at that. Let me, uh, my time's running out, let me simply state um, I indicated earlier that I was very troubled by Mr. Ickey's conduct in this particular instance. We have had uh, now just a new reference to a whole issue of conspiracy and in the notion that we ought not to have an independent counsel here based on conspiracy. We also had uh, the ranking minority member simply describe the conduct in your office as clumsy behavior. I'm deeply troubled by a second aspect of this case. I have known you for over 20 years. I have respected you for over 20 years and still do. But I have also known Paul Eckstein for over 20 years and worked extensively with him as well and have respected him as well. And there is a very, very, very troubling conflict between his statement of what occurred in the meeting in your office and your statement that you cannot in any way recollect it. And regrettably, um, I think that is a part of the record and I think it does, between Mr. Ickey's conduct and Mr. Eckstein's allegation, create an, a circumstance in which I hope we can, through some process, ultimately find a resolution. My time's expired. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, my good friend, Mr. Konjorski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, when we all use the word conspiracy, it, it's uh, with the idea that we lose our proportions because we're able to take threads unrelated sometimes and weave them together to make them appear something other than what they are. And uh, in taking these few minutes, I just wanted to call together that uh, a lot, lot has been made of a, a fundraising dinner held on the 13th of July in 1995 and uh, it closely coincided with the decision-making process. And then my friends on your side of the aisle had said, ah, see, obviously this fundraiser raising $440,000 by Mr. Snyder, one of the largest lobbying or members or partner of one of the largest lobbying organizations in Washington, did something wrong here directly related to this decision. Now, now, you know, to the average American out there watching this program, they may say, gee, those dates are awfully coincidental, and maybe there's some smoke there, maybe there's something wrong. Except, Mr. Chairman, you and I, members of this committee, should know better. Fundraiser held in Washington, D.C. at $1,000 a head, having the President of the United States and his wife there, is not something that our gang comedy gets together and says, let's have a party. It takes months of planning, months of reservation of time, no possibility 
that anybody putting that fundraiser together would ever imagine that the department, the day before, the day after, would be arriving at this decision. And yet, it looks like a conspiracy to the untrained mind and to the untrained eye. Further, th that wasn't Indian money. That was $1,000 hard money by 350, 400 people from the Washington, D.C. area invited to a very successful lobbyist home. Was that wrong? No. Is it legal? Yes. Did it cause any problems? Only in the minds of those people that want to see some conspiracy or some connection. Then we have this troubling testimony of Mr. Eckstein. And I agree with my, the gentleman from uh, Arizona. I know he is quite a lobbyist and recognized person in town, but I find it incredible that he is that clairvoyant, that he knows Indians over the next 18 months are going to contribute $356,000, and he is able to miss that mark by uh, 150000 by the secretary apparently seizing it. And I think I know what happened. I think Mr. Eckstein heard about ultimately these contributions over the next 18 months from the decision. And for some reason, that confusion jumped in his mind. And maybe through other conversations he had, he jumped to the conclusion that maybe that was said at the meeting. I doubt whether it could be said. But if I have to make my bets, I don't think they hold that secret for two years. And finally, it comes down to something Mr. Waxman said. We're not arguing here about poor Indians and rich Indians and somebody had been done wrong. There's nobody on this committee and nobody that I've ever read about that didn't say this is the right decision. That this cabinet officer or this department resolved this decision the way it should have been made. And we're out here trying to fry him and his integrity and and his professionalism and his independence because he made the right decision. Because we feel so sorry for that, uh, what was that, doggy track, the d dead doggy track in Wisconsin owned by these very wealthy Floridian uh, uh, gaming people that were wronged. Why were they here to make millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars of casino gambling that they otherwise could not have made except for the provision of the Indian law that allow Indians to get some benefit? And they tried to misuse and abuse that. First, they got one Indian tribe and went with it, and they turned them down, didn't like them. Mr. Haver, uh, Nick said he didn't like their integrity, so he changed. The new Indians come in, and you can't fault them. Found money, any opportunity was worth their while they went in. But who was the gainer? The guy with the dead dog track, losing millions every year. Was he at a disadvantage? No. He hired Eckstein. He hired the best lawyers, the best lobbyists. And by God, if it had been money, you could bet your life contributions would have been on his side. He certainly did not have the money to do it. He spent millions up to that point and millions since on appeals and otherwise. We saw four or five powerful lawyers himself sit in this room. He ran up legal bills in this room today or the four days here over fifty dollars or $100,000. He's not a poor man. He would have used his money. This was a tough decision. The decision was made right, and there was a loser. One other thing, we just got in some communications today. You know, Mr. Havnick cast dispersions on that Indian tribe that he didn't want to uh, uh, join with. He said he didn't like their management skills. As I understand, the National Indian Gaming Commission issued a press release, and it just said that he, they're going to close one of the casinos owned by uh, uh, Mr. Havnick because of violation of... Uh, oh, no. oh, what? Okay. I run, I'm sorry, not by Mr. Havnick, but by one of the tribes that were petitioners here because of their violation of regulations and the gaming ordinance. Now, maybe in the end, how funny it will be that this department and these staff people made the right decision, and we as the Congress, in order to find something wrong politically and in campaign finance and connecting all these dis uh, disparage it, uh, threats, to create a conspiracy, there isn't any. They did the right thing at the right time for the right purpose under the rules and under the merits. And I think we should say, Mr. Secretary, if this should cost you your consideration for the Supreme Court after your distinguished career, that is grossly unfortunate.
and I don't think in the end it will. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Barr, you will be our final questioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, just uh, for the record, uh, earlier today we referred to a document, uh, a copy of a notation from uh, President Clinton to Mr. Panetta inquiring about the status of the Wisconsin tribe Indian dispute. And uh, a reference was made when I discussed that, and that was introduced into the record, uh, about the White House seeking to preclude and stop its, uh, its publication uh, to keep that document from the public. Uh, it was indeed uh, one of the 10 documents listed on a privilege log uh, submitted to us in October of 1997, Exhibit 150-2. Item number six. So that is in the record, and I want to make very clear today that that is the case. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I'd like to go back briefly to your discussions uh, that we referenced shortly ago with Mr. Bowles and Mr. Ruff, White House Counsel, uh, about the statements uh, by Mr. Eckstein. Uh, what exactly did you discuss with, that, with them, and when was that discussion or those discussions? Yes, I met <clears throat> just. I would guess uh, the, the date will be obviously available. I think it was in uh, sometime in October. It's probably a five-minute meeting. Uh, would that be I mean before October 10th, before your letter? Um, I I don't. I mean, you, I, you submitted I, I, a letter to Senator Thompson on yeah, the 10th. I, okay, it, it was after I wrote the Thompson letter. After. Yes. Okay, so you had no discussions whatsoever with them about that letter. That's correct. It had already been written. Uh, what was the nature of your discussions with them? Uh, this matter had come up in the press, and uh, they were, uh, uh, Mr. Bowles was interested in uh, what uh, the dispute was about. I described uh, the, uh, the letters uh, very briefly. Uh, he uh, asked. Uh, I explained that I'd never spoken to Ickes. That was the White House issue that he was interested in, and I uh, said, no, I've never spoken uh, uh, to Mr. Ickes. Uh, and uh, he suggested to me uh, that I should, uh, you know, talk to Senator McCain, and that was about it. But you're, you're very clear in your mind that, that you had no meetings with Mr. or no discussions at all with Mr. Bowles or Mr. Ruff before your October 10th, 1997 letter to Senator Thompson. I'm quite clear about that. Okay. Uh, did you have any have any emails or written I'm I'm certain, I'm certain that them. I did not. Okay. Could I have a moment, please? Uh, was there anyone outside of, uh, of your immediate office that assisted with the preparation of the October 10th letter to Senator Thompson? Uh, the letter to Senator Thompson, uh, outside my immediate office, no, sir. No. Okay. Uh, with regard to the, to the other letter that I think we've discussed and that's also in the record, and that is the uh, August 30, 1996 letter to uh, Senator McCain. Uh, did you have any discussions or receive any assistance from anybody uh, at the White House uh, in the preparation of that letter? Uh, no, I did not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's uh, yields back to balance his time. Uh, regarding the issue of privilege mentioned earlier, I will enter letters between the committee and the White House and a 36-page CRS opinion on this matter into the record uh, without objection. And uh, Congressman Gilman and uh, others would like to submit, who weren't here today, would like to submit uh, uh, questions to you, Mr. Secretary. We'd appreciate it if you'd answer those. Certainly. Uh, in conclusion, I'd like to note that we will be returning again to foreign money in the political system shortly. In connection with that, I would like to note that two people we have been focusing on for some time, Charlie Tree and Antonio Pan, recently were indicted in connection with their funding of illegal foreign money into the DNC. Our first, hearings, uh, our, our first hearings focused on both Mr. Tree and Antonio Pan, and we'll be continuing into these areas, which clearly bear fr further scrutiny. 
And uh, with that, uh, Mr. Secretary, we want to thank you very much for your patience and for being with us today. We stand adjourned. Nice to see you. Tell Steve I said hello. Tell him to sing. He only drove for half a day today. Tell him I'm trying to leave it. The U.S. House next meets on Tuesday at 12:30 p.m. Eastern for morning hour speeches. 2 p.m. for legislative business. Issues next week include renaming.